<laughs> Bring me those puppies. <laughs> Bring me those puppies. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Um, today on the AMA, we're going to start chit chatting a little, uh, a little, uh, a little, uh, a little Cruella de Vil, a little WandaVision, a little bit of everything. I noticed the other day that many of you really enjoy talking films and TV and also like looking at stuff that I happen to have in my little repertoire here. And I'm more than happy to share those things with you as I answer questions. But again, have you seen the Cruella trailer? <laughs> Bring me those puppies. What I like about it is it's not called 101, 102, fill in the blank here, Dalmatians. It's actually tall, it's actually called Cruella. And the thing I love about that, I've got to say, is that it's about Cruella. And it looks like how she became Cruella. Um, I don't know. It's just for the first time, it's a Disney live action film I'm actually super excited about. I mean, I really am. Okay. I am so excited about it. But we have lots to talk about with Cruella DeVille because guys, guys, have you seen on YouTube the parallel uh, trailer cut between it and the Joker? Have you seen that? My husband says, looks like a lift to him. <laughs> Meaning someone loved the Joker trailer and then all of a sudden it became the Cruella trailer. Just switch it. If you haven't seen it, you got to see it. It's a side by side. It's on YouTube. I probably should have, you know, posted, you know, shown it here, but you know, it's easy to find. You just, you just look for the Cruella trailer and that's where my husband showed it to me. He showed it to me on YouTube because I, I love my villains. Okay. I'm going to tell you, I love villains. Who doesn't love villains? Y'all love villains. Post in the comments to me if you love villains. And if you're joining me late, we're talking about, if you're joining me on the non-live broadcast, we're talking about Cruella DeVille and other stuff today. And go ahead and post your comments. Uh, go ahead and post questions in the comments. Uh, and uh, I'm going to pop in and out of that because that seems to be what you guys like. Uh, and who knows, you know, you can't say what do people like, and what do they don't you want to do, you want to keep true to yourself. But by the same token, you seem to like me do my right foot in and my right foot out and my right foot in and I shake it all about. So basically, I'm going to put a foot into the comments, come out, talk to talk about a few questions that I have on my paper here. As usual, those of you who uh, wrote in early or Leo, who has put some questions up for me, bless his heart. Uh, and we've got lots and lots to talk about. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about Cruella de Vil. We're going to talk about the Cruella de Vil versus Joker. And seriously, guys, go to YouTube and check that out. Just put in Cruella de Vil slash Joker and you'll see what I mean. And look for the one that is side by side. Now, that being said, and let me just take a minute to get my teapot here. Um... That being said, uh, the one that I like is the Cruella DeVille trailer and someone has put over it the Joker soundtrack. So people are having fun on this YouTube and uh, have got me, got me just tickled pink at the fact that, um, you know, how similar it is. I don't mind it being so similar. Yeah, yeah, like my husband says, it's a lift, but I, I don't know. I think it's a good lift. I think it really is. It's pretty wild, you know. A lot of people say she, uh, the Cruella de Vil, at least at the final part, reminds them of Harley Quinn. Does it do you? And if so, post in the comments why. Now, again, you remember if you have joined me before, and if you haven't joined me before, welcome. Think about subscribing. I sit here. We come in from reality and have a cool, you sit by the fire and I tell stories or we discuss things that interest all of us like film and TV, movies, because who gets to go to a theater, right? So, so that's, uh, there we go. Yay! Okay, back to one. All right, so that's kind of the whole deal. That's called the whole situation. Uh, 
that Cruella DeVille, to me, looks cool. Uh, I don't want to spoil it for you because there are some sequences in there that make me pretty hungry, look pretty, pretty good. So let me just talk to you because I do do films. I am working behind the scenes an awful lot. I build cosplay costumes and I, um, I build a lot of cosplay costumes. At the time, it wasn't called cosplay. It was costume, costume cavalcade. And I do do that. And what I'm going to uh, share with you, <clears throat> pardon me, are some of the things that I have built. I'm just sort of, you know, quickly digging through what I've got, okay? And I'll share with you, okay? But the point is, I've done acting on films, Ghostbusters, Men in Black, Jungle to Jungle, Indian in the Cupboard, Flintstones 1 and 2, Men in Black 1 and 2, uh, uh, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Ghostbusters, the original. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But uh, my point is that the thing that one must always remember, because apparently, according to my husband, who does a lot of reading, okay, I'm out here under a hot light sculpting and creating things as much as I can. One of the things is the hitchhiking ghosts. Many of you probably know about these hitchhiking ghosts. And uh, they are now being shipped, the illuminated ghosts and the black light ghosts. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, again, in the comments or in the comments, just ask me the question and I will be more than happy to answer and show you what I'm talking about. But with, late recently, now recently, I mean, within the past, what is it, eight to 10 years the people who create the teaser trailers have a really difficult job because people are getting a hold of the film early and then sharing it on social media illegally. How they do it, who knows? But because of this, studios, Warner Brothers, Universal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Disney are very, very guided, guarded as well they should be about their product. So now you're trying to do a trailer, a teaser trailer, but they're not willing to give you material. So you've got this material that you're trying to do a trailer so people will come. But Disney's like, no, I don't want to give it. And they're like, but you got to give it. But you're like, no. And they're like, you got to. And you're like, no. <laughs> And so as a person who creates the teaser trailers for films, you have a very difficult job. That's point number one, because they don't, they don't want to release too much to you because the more they release, the more they run the risk of it getting out into areas that they shouldn't too early. Okay. The second point is that if they have any kind of CG or computer generated stuff in it, it may or may not be around during the time the teaser trailer is being created. So there was a couple of really nice effects in this trailer. And again, I don't want to spoil it for you. But those effects may not be perfected yet. They looked good to me, but they may not quite be perfected. The choice in performances may not be the actual performance you're going to see later. So give this beautiful actress who is playing Cruella, and I think it's beautifully cast, uh, a break. <laughs> because it's not her fault. Okay? They may, uh, uh, Disney may have given them just one take or two takes, and it may not be the take that actually ends up in the film because the film is still being made. Okay? Yeah. I mean, this is the same with Star Wars stuff. This is the same with everything. When you see a trailer or a teaser trailer, it's usually not pristine perfect. They'll do the best they can because as a, a person who creates these teaser trailers, you only can work with what you got, you know? And that's why I'm saying, you know, you may at first say the actress doesn't seem like she's in her game. And this is one of the comments that my husband apparently read. Not true. You know, they may have pulled, uh, they may have been given a cut that isn't even ever gonna be used in the movie. You guys know, that you've seen movies where you go and the movie is completely different from the preview. One of the ones that comes to mind is Falling Down. It looked like a comedy, but when you saw it, it was like, oh my goodness. 
You know, this is because at the time of the teaser, they could only go by the amount of things they were spoon fed. And oh, looks like a comedy. And then you go see the movie and you go, whoa, that wasn't a comedy. You know what I mean? So this is why I'm saying, you know, you got to give them a little grain of salt because it's not like the days of Gone with the Wind or the days of, um, um, well, you know, in the days of things like Star Wars, Close Encounters, E.T., et cetera, et cetera, we did less in, 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 in movie trailers. So the one that comes to mind is Alien, the movie Alien, which was released in 1979. And before Alien came out, one of the best previews ever, it was just an egg and then light came out and it did this. So the egg came in and it made this sound. As the egg got bigger and bigger and bigger in 70 millimeter. And then it was, which was the A in alien. And then the L as the egg came forward, right? And then it said alien. This all took maybe about a minute, right? Then the egg cracked. And a light came out. Oh! Oh! Done. Had us said hello, okay? <laughs> we were so there. <laughs> Scary, suspenseful. That's all we saw. But in today's film, because people have, in today's teaser trailers, I think if you were to talk to someone who actually created a teaser trailer, they would tell you, they can't get away with that. They can't do that anymore because you guys, not necessarily you guys, but people demand more. They want to see what they're going to be doing because they can sit in the Barca lounger and watch it with the remote. So how do we get people in the movie theater? This is, of course, before COVID-19. But this was the challenge. So they started showing, I mean, have you ever seen a trailer where you feel like, what's the point of watching the movie? Because you've seen the beginning, the end, and the middle in the trailer. You may still go, but that's what I'm saying. You know, today's films tell you way too, way more than, than I feel is necessary, but I understand their plight, their drama, their, their challenge. So back to Cruella Cruel Cruel de Vil. Cruella de Vil, you know, they're, 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 jumping on this actress who's playing this character. And I think she looks fantastic. I think that the effects that I saw looked beautiful. And yes, it does parallel the Joker trailer. There's no getting around that. Whoever did the trailer really loved the teaser trailer, really loved the Joker teaser trailer. And it's kind of fun to watch them side by side. It, I, I don't know. I thought that was kind of cool. And, uh, you know, but I think the movie is going to be a lot of fun and I'm really looking forward to it. it it's it got me hooked, <laughs> all set, you know, and she's got an amazing <laughs> laugh. Her laugh is just beautiful. And all I want is to not be disappointed, you know, because I have to remember, as we all do, that this is the teaser trailer. We don't know what's going to happen. So let me just point one other thing out. Did you guys, you know, the Matthew, the Matthew Broderick Godzilla, you remember, do you remember that preview where there's three fishermen on a pier and the one guy says, I, I think I got something. And all of a sudden there's this big, <laughs> there's this bump in the water and it's moving towards them. <laughs> do you remember that? And then all of a sudden he goes like this and it's an eye and it cuts. We were crazy for that. And then we saw the movie and it wasn't very good. Okay. So sometimes your teaser trailer guy has got, is really on the ball. And then you go and see it and you go, Ooh, that movie wasn't what I expected. The door, the gate swings both ways, guys, is what I'm saying. So this is my knowledge because I've been in the film industry since I was about 20 years old. So that's where that all comes from. And I had promised to show you a few things 
So let me just do that. So it's going to jump around a little bit because that's the way my photos work. And I apologize for that. But uh, you still can see the things really quickly and we'll talk. So I'm just going to slowly work my way up the little chain here until I spot a costume that I have created. And then I will show it to you. Deal? Deal! Okay, so... Uh, so this is what my point is, is that I make a lot of costumes, not only for myself, but for other people. And when you're recreating costumes, it's the same deal. So for example, if you remember the old Battlestar Galactica, maybe you don't, you should check it out. Uh, John Dykstra, uh, who did the effects for the original Star Wars films, you know, he also did this Battlestar Galactica, which effects wise was beautiful. But you remember the Cylons had a light here? Woo, 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 woo. Kind of like kit car. <laughs> I'm dating myself, aren't I? Um, the suit that the Cylons wore was these little strips of silver. Well, guys, if you ever got to see that actual costume, the people who made those Cylons took a half inch of spandex, which is a straight material, three quarters of an inch, more like half inch. Okay. So we're talking about that big. Okay. And they sewed piping every half inch for like a hundred to give you that silver, clear, silver, boop, 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 boop down. Somebody sat and saw, sewed that all in one at a time. When I saw that suit, I was like, oh, heck no. I mean, that is a lot of work. So for these costumes, people really, the industry, the costumers, there's brilliant people involved on all levels that create some really great stuff. So I did a Halloween event and I made this hat right here. This is the Hella hat. It's for a book that I'm working on called Light as a Feather because I saw a girl. Now this is one of the people, one of the participants in the convention who came and she actually fits the hat. I don't fit the hat. I made the hat, but I didn't fit the hat. So people were welcome to come up. If they loved being Hella, they could come and try it on. And you're standing in front of the uh, Sleeping Beauty castle. And this is how um, people find me is uh, this castle drapery in this Halloween where most of the things were like roadkill. Roadkill meaning, you know, guys are bleeding and the eye is hanging out. People would run to this booth and go, oh, thank gosh, I feel better. Oh, it's a Disney booth. I feel safe. It's scary here. And I was more than happy to help. But uh, this, hella, this hella hat was a hat that I did to draw attention to my booth. And here is another young lady who wore it as well. So they, they were super fans of um, Marvel, Marvel, right? You got to save me on this. So uh, this is what's so cool about it. So I made that and it's very light. It's light as a <laughs> feather. So, uh, so I made that, I, I built that. I also Really early as a young girl, I made this right here. This is a jester outfit for the Renaissance Fair. And I was the queen's fool. I made this off of a little playing card, no bigger than two inches by one inch. And from that came this beautiful uh, jester outfit. I played the queen's jester for three years out at the Paramount Ranch in um, in the Paramount Ranch little farther, Cane and New Road, all that stuff, California. Anyway, so uh, so there was that as well, but I was this obsessive creative and I, I felt that making costumes for myself, I wouldn't complain. Have you ever made costumes for someone else and they're whining because it they whine for whatever reason? Yeah, I won't say what reason, but they, they kind of go, oh, it hurts here or it hurts there or blah, blah, blah. And you're like, really? Come on, you ordered this costume. Um, but anyway, here is my Catwoman. And uh, I love the Michelle Pfeiffer Catwoman. And uh, I actually learned how to work the whip. So I, I crack a mean bull whip, guys. And I really can work it. Her nails are actually made out of 
uh, silverware and thimbles, just like the actual movie where Michelle Pfeiffer played the Catwoman. The only thing I don't have in my gloves, and if I can pull them out, would you like to see them? Not today, because I've got to go in my garage to get them. But if you're interested in looking at my Catwoman helmet, like I'm wearing there, I still have it. And my whip, I still have it. The outfit needs to be uh, remade because it's very, it's, it's, it's worn. I, I, I spent some time wearing it. So, uh, but if you're interested in seeing some of the parts, I'll show you the gloves in the actual movie, Michelle Pfeiffer had needles in her claws and I didn't want, because I'm live, I didn't want to have needles in the costume because somebody could get hurt. So this is the thing when you're doing a cosplay costume, you have to remember that the ones that you love were made for the film and the movie industry. Here's my history coming back, right? And you want to do it for live, okay? So if there's things that are dangerous or things that could hurt someone, you want to rethink that. The other thing I did with this costume is that I made the stitching out of silver thread so that at night, which was when I was mostly going to be performing the Catwoman, uh, she would twinkle. She, it, the thread was white in the movie and it was actually a little bit of elastic, but I changed that. You have that because you're going to be live. You're going to be in front of people. People are going to be, you know, super close, right? And, um, and because they're super close, you know, this close, you want the, the details to be pretty. So, uh, mention in the comments below or over here, uh, if you, if you want to see, uh, some of those components, if you'd like to see some of the components of my costumes, I don't have a ton, but I do have some like, uh, my mermaid tail here, this mermaid tail, I swam in, I did a lot of commercials back in 1980 through 1980 through, I think 2000. I did a submarine commercial with that mermaid tail. I played the mermaid. My hair wasn't in dreadlocks at the time. So um, the dreadlocks didn't happen until 2000. They didn't get started till 2000 when I was doing country bears. But uh, before that, my hair was, you know, was straight. So I would wet it down, put on whatever wig the client wanted. So if they thought of a redheaded mermaid or they thought of a blonde or they thought of blue hair, you know, I had all these wigs laid out. They picked one and they... They built a mermaid using my mermaid tail, and it really does swim. And if I can find that footage, I will show you. But at this point, uh, the footage is like the Ark of the Covenant. It's buried. But uh, if I can find it, I'll be happy to show it to you, okay? Because dreadlocks were not always my special hairstyle of choice. So I'm looking to see if I have a small example I don't see it yet, but if I do come across it, I will be happy to show it to you, um, what my hair looked like. But I basically would just, you know, slick it down and then put a wig on top and I could be anything. In the case of the Catwoman, I slicked it down and then, you know, it was all just the cat thing, you know, the nick and everything, all the hair was inside. Never happened with all of this. In fact, after I had dreadlocks, I wore the Catwoman outfit one more time. And when I did, I actually redesigned the, the headdress so that all of this pulled back as tight as it could. And it came out the back like a ponytail. So you had the Catwoman helmet here and then you had all of this stuff back there. But I have very thick hair. I mean, you could cut some of it off and I would never notice. Don't do it though. But again, in this Catwoman outfit, as you can see, the whole helmet is, in, is encompassing, you know, it's, it's encompassing my whole head. I also had blue contacts in my eyes while working a whip. I'm really like many of you who, who do cosplay really very particular about making sure all of the details, especially since someone is going to be what this close. So, um, in the case of the Catwoman, um, I learned to work the bullwhip. I do some great bullwhip work. I don't know how I could possibly show you that on a live thing, but maybe I'll take a video and I'll show you, you know, I, I won't be in the cat suit because the cat suit itself started to deteriorate. And, uh, so all I have left is the hat, the cat hat and the gloves and maybe the corset. I was thinking about doing it again, but, uh, who knows if that's going to happen, you know, as you get older, you know, you say, 
you know, you pick, you pick your battles. Don't you pick your battles when you get older? Yeah. And I do a lot of sculpting. So, you know, Hey, do I, do I do these costumes? You know, whatever. So here I was with a team of people that built this marshmallow man. This was for Ghostbusters. Here's another thing. So this isn't a cosplay thing, but this was for the actual movie. And this happy go lucky staple of marshmallow man is bouncing along the street. This is actually the street set at Stetson Visual Arts. And uh, the, the Marshmallow Man is bouncing along. This is when he comes down the street. And the Ghostbusters say, Mother Puss! <laughs> That's him bouncing along. And the person in the suit is my, oh, it would be a good thing to put tea. Forgive me, guys. I poured the water but didn't make the tea. <laughs> Did you know that tea next to uh, it, uh, tea next to water is the most drunk beverage in the world, and eighty percent of households in the U.S. drink tea? I always thought it was coffee. I don't know. Did you think it was coffee? I thought it was coffee, but I digress because I'm making my tea right now. So thank you for letting me have a brief pause while I make my tea and you look at the Marshmallow Man. So back to the Marshmallow Man costume. Um, and if Leo Holzer is watching, see Leo, you don't have to work so hard when it comes to questions because I can fill it, baby. <laughs> Y'all know that if you saw last week's, which was four hours and people were like, whoa, but it just flowed last week. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, back to this picture of Stay Puffed. So my friend Bill Beretta, Billy Beretta, he, uh, Billy Beretta, Billy Beretta is Earl Sinclair. Billy, oh, Billy, I'm sorry. Brian, Brian, Bill Bryant. Okay. Bill, if you're listening, forgive me. It's been crazy weeks. That's the only excuse, but I'm sticking to it. Um, anyway, uh, Bill designed it, and I'm just going to look and see if I have a series that I can show you. I was hoping I had a picture of Bill in here, but I don't see it. But I will show it to you if I can find it at some point. But we worked so hard on this that at one point we made Marshmallow Hitler. So in the film business, you're working hours that can be often just insane. You do very little sleep. If you've ever worked on a rose float in your sleep, you slept in your car, this is what this can feel like times with Ghostbusters. We were doing Ghostbusters. They were on a deadline and we were working like crazy. The problem is if you don't give people day, days off during the week, like for example, they were giving us one in seven to rest and then they did it. Well, seven days becomes 14 days becomes 21 days. And the next thing you know, you're sitting there contemplating the sparkle, you know, the sparkle of your sculpting tool. Whoa. And the Ghostbusters producers came and saw like at day 21, most of us are like, ooh. Wow, because we're just exhausted. We're working so crazy. So producers gave us back one day and seven to like do laundry, visit home and stop contemplating our sculpting tools. You know, because, because you all of a sudden realize your budget is, whoa, wow, huh, what? So it was pretty funny, you know, it, uh, <coughs> But we, forgive me, I got a little excited there, but we built this Marshmallow Hitler because there were times as sculptors, we kind of felt like, like we were being dictated to. Please understand it was all in good fun. Ghostbusters was a great, great opportunity. And we loved working there, but we were also very grateful for our one day and seven to rest. You know, you just got to give your people a little time to rest. So like I said, if I can find Billy in here, I will show him to you. But even as early as college, uh, I was doing mime. And that's all my hair. That's not a wig. That's my hair and my dear friend. We used to do a lot of of uh, mime. I worked with uh, George Jamal, who worked with Marcel Marceau, who was really known for mime. 
So I did a lot of shows and stuff as a mime, and I still do it pretty well, but I haven't done it in a while because, you know, hello, I'm older now. Not that that's an excuse, but as a mime, this is what I did. So, so we have all of these various cosplay outfits, and I was going to show you um, another one that I did that I know you guys would love, but for some reason it's eluding me, and I think because it has a personality. Oh, there he is. Okay, so here's my Wookiee. So when I saw Star Wars, I fell in love with Star Wars. Uh, the room stretched for me. I'm writing a book that will, I hope will come out in May, hopefully on May the 4th, that tells my Star Wars story. So you'll hear more about that as the days continue. But this is my Wookiee. He's actually seven feet tall. That is me inside. And I am ducking as I'm going through. And I'm walking around my college. But I went to a place here in Southern California at that time back in 1978, 79, called uh, Little Tokyo. And I sent away for some Japanese star logs. And listen, if you want to see those Japanese star logs, yes, I still have them. <laughs> at least I think I do. And I can pull them out so you can see them if I can find them. So again, post in the comments if you're interested in seeing that stuff. And I'll, in a future AMA, be happy to show them to you. I mean, this is what I'm doing is showing you some visual stuff so that you have a more interesting things to watch while I chatter away and tell you stories, right? Okay. So that Wookiee was the one of the first. And I came home and I had fur all over the floor. I was in college and my father came home from work and saw all this fur over the floor. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm making a Wookiee, dad. And he went, okay, uh, make sure you vacuum when you're done. And went on with, about his evening. My parents were so used to this crazy kid creating crazy weird stuff consistently. And this is the foundation of an Imagineer, by the way. If you did crazy stuff as a kid or throughout your life and people thought you were a nut, you're Imagineer material, okay? And that's not a derogatory. That's the truth. That's absolute truth. And I will tell you the absolute truth all the time. I will tell you the truth. So uh, so there you go. There are a few. Here's a close-up of my Wookiee. See, so he was really cute. He was a little bit big and I didn't know about first. So what I did was I took a Don Post mask and uh, you, if you, if you've been back far enough, 1977, there was an amazing mask maker uh, retired now, I think. Let me know if you know if Don Post company is still making the mask, but Don Post is, is gone. But he made these beautiful masks. He made a C-3PO, he made a Darth Vader, and he made a Wookiee. And I still have a Wookiee preserved, a Wookiee mask. Yeah, I'm I'm probably going to sell it. So if it's something you'd like, then, you know, hit me up in the comments if it's something, you know, you'd like. Just let me know. It is the original one from 1977, 1980, that era. What I did was I took that mask and I made another one based on that. And then the lower jaw is glued to my chin. And I used super glue. No, I did not use Gorilla Glue. But I did use super glue. So crazy is crazy, right? Now, I knew super glue worked because I tested it. And my sweat would make the super glue crystallize and fall off. So, but what was that doing to my skin or whatever as a, as a, as a kid, I felt I suffered for my art. So here's what, that's what's happening there. Okay. So there you go. Basically, what am I saying? Cosplay crazy. This is my Yoda. I sculpted him with a pair of scissors. Fiskers. See these scissors? These, these, you know what these look like. I sewed the whole thing together. I built my own lightsaber, my Luke Skywalker lightsaber. I still have it around here. It did not, you know, but uh, I have one of those. It looks like Obi-Wan's. I built that at uh, Galaxy's Edge and I love it. I thought I was going to sell it, but I love it. But I used these scissors and mattress foam, you know, the foam that's in your couch. In fact, I actually took it from my mom and dad's couch. They weren't too happy about that, but they did like that Yoda 
looked good. So here's my sculpted Yoda puppet. And the eyes are uh, ping pong balls that I hand painted. And then I handmade everything, fingernails, clothing. And he does operate really well. And I think I have him in my garage, but he wouldn't operate very well because soft foam, the foam that's in your couch, you know, you replace those, those a lot. And, um, and so he got a little crunchy, but I just couldn't throw him away. He's, he was part of me, you know, puppets are part of your family. So if I can find him and, uh, next week I am doing a lot of work in my garage, so we might be able to find him. And if so, I will show you what he looks like. If I do, he's as old as my mermaid tail, right? He's, well, he's older. He's older than my mermaid tail. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a scissors technique that you use. Nowadays, I'm, I'm actually thinking of teaching a puppet class. I've got a couple people reaching out and asking me to teach a puppet class. So I'm thinking of teaching a puppet class. And uh, uh, when I do, I'll do a webinar. Just just give me a little more a little more time because I've got to get the ghosts in a rhythmic fashion so that I can feel like they're humming along and I can add something to my my back, so to speak. So anyway, so this is what, like I said, this is uh, just, you're noticing, aren't you? Countless over and over and over and over and over again. I am making puppets and I am making costumes and I am making stuff. So how did we get to this? Uh, how, how did we get here? is because we were talking about Cruella de Vil and some of these amazing costumes that they're making. So as a result, because I make costumes and help others make theirs as well, that I really appreciate a good, um, good, good costume work. And so these were very impressive. To, to me. I thought they were fun. I mean, the actress must have had a blast. I always say, what was it like to do the movie? Even if the movie was not a good movie, was it fun to make? And then it just turned out not to be good. So for example, the country bears was a blast to do, but we got railroaded by the internet because certain things leaked out and the people who were making the Country Bears movie got cold feet and they started to make it more about the people and less about the bears. Originally, it was all about the bears, baby. All about the bears, about the bears. Um, and then they started to read the internet and people started blasting it before they even saw it, which really drives me a little crazy. And the bears got, the bears got, uh, the Country Bears sort of got sideswiped. But they are amazing. And if you haven't seen The Country Bears, watch it. And I apologize for the people stuff because the people stuff is kind of funny, but not as cool as those bears are. And if you have some questions about the audio animatronic bears, it's a two puppet situation, meaning that the you've got a person doing the face articul articulation for these bears built by the Henson Company, Jim Henson and Company. And I was Big Al and Trixie. I played the face on those. And the people in the suits were uh, suit performers of extraordinary ability. And we worked as a team to create Big Al, to create Trixie, to create Henry, to create Barry. And if you want to hear stories about some of that stuff, ask me, because the bears are on Disney+, Plus, as are dinosaurs. So if you have questions, specific questions, that you don't seem that you're getting answered, this is the place every Friday at 9 to ask those questions. Don't be shy, okay? Don't be shy. If... If you ask a question and I don't think it's appropriate, I'm not going to answer it. But most of the stuff I answer. All right. So so don't be shy. Answer. You know, I'm happy to answer them for you. I know I'm kind of filling in the questions for you now, but that's because uh, I know how many people have kind of reached out to me during the week and have asked these questions. And one of the questions was Cruella de Vil, which really looks cool. But the Cruella de Vil thing, uh, you know, some people thought the costume wasn't cool. And some people thought the, I don't know what you didn't think was cool. I mean, it's a teaser trailer. Give them a break. Wait till the movie and then give your opinion, okay? Because let me tell you something. The original Maleficent, the best thing about it was Angelina Jolie as Maleficent. She looked beautiful. And the Maleficent costume was amazing, but I did not like the movie. Oh, I thought that movie was awful. 
I don't know if you've seen it, but don't. Okay. Um, I, I just thought it was terrible. And then they made another one and I just couldn't bring myself to go. I'm sorry. So I just look at pictures of Angelina Lo Jolie because she really does make a beautiful Maleficent. But that's about as far as I can go, guys, because I did not like this movie. I thought this movie was not good. Uh, I welcome your comments. Here are a couple of other things that I did. So again, here is my Catwoman. This is a little bit better picture of her. But uh, I actually asked another person who was an expert in courses, corsets to make my corset for me. And my best friend helped me make the pattern so that it really was so that we could hide the seams. The outfit is uh, known as uh, plated double knit. So uh, it's not like leather or that plastic stuff that you saw in American Horror Story. That was seriously creepy. But uh, this is, it, it's very flexible. Um, and then I built everything and then I learned how to work the whip. Learned all about the whip. Next to it is Magenta from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Woo woo. Yes, I did this character too at the Tiffany Theater for two years. And we brought down the house. It was in the 80s. We did a midnight show and a two o'clock show and the cast was phenomenal. And this is my spacesuit from the Rocky Horror Picture Show right down to the bolt, the lightning bolt on the chest. So I did the hair, I did the makeup, I did the gloves. I mean, check out those gloves. I don't have those gloves anymore, but oh my gosh. And uh, uh, it was a great time. We did real theater. They played the movie. Those of you who like the Rocky Horror Picture Show, they played the movie and then we were up on stage performing. And at one point, Tim Curry, Patricia Quinn, and um, and uh, Richard O'Brien, et cetera, et cetera, came down and performed with us. So I actually got to do the time warp next to Patricia Quinn. It was... It was fun. This you may not recognize. And a lot of people said, who made the salad? Meaning the chest. Because I would say the breasts were made out of salad bowls. I did a body cast of myself and made this character. This is a character from a Japanese anime thing that Dr. Osamu Tezuka did. And it's called uh, Olga from Phoenix 2772. And I'm holding a trophy. So this is the 1980 San Diego comic book convention. I cannot sit down in this outfit, not made to sit down. And my headdress is a little crooked, as you can tell. And again, I slicked my hair down and wore the blonde wig. But this is the character and I took first place. And the extra joy when I did this, and those of you who do the San Diego Comic Book Convention and do the uh, cosplay know that it lasts the whole day now. This only lasted two hours. This was 1980 when the comics were about, when the Comic-Con was mostly about comic books. If you want to see the actual book that this was taken from, Dr. Tezka, I am happy to share that with you as well. Uh, but I did this because this was a very special character to Dr. Tezka, and I wanted to uh, celebrate him, so I made this character. And um, here I am in the mermaid tail at uh, Worldcon. So, and I found my Worldcon credentials when I debuted my mermaid. Now here we're in a public, uh, uh, you notice that the hair here, this is kind of the sort of the um, um, Daryl Hannah hairstyle, sort of. It's a little shorter. Hers was very long. And that's because in the film, they needed to make sure that the hair covered the tasty bits, if you will, okay? Especially when she's in the sand uh, seeing Tom uh, Tom Hanks, and they they glued it to her tailbone and to the front because they wanted it to be a G PG kind of movie, and so that's why her hair was so long to cover the tasty bits. Here, I just uh, created a, uh, a top for myself that sort of looked like I made it out of maybe coral or something, and I'm at a swimming pool. I can't quite remember where this was done. OK, I can't remember exactly what, but the swimming pool was a rooftop swimming pool. Most hotels have a rooftop swimming pool, so I know that doesn't help you. But I took first place with this as well. And then when people saw it actually swim in the swimming pool, they just lost their little minds. Woo! -hoo! 
So this is that, this is that mermaid tail you just saw me sitting at the pool was the first version. This is my second. This is actually my second version of my mermaid tail. Third, second, second version. And, uh, and so there you go. So anyway, that's basically a few quick ideas, but my costuming happened a lot. So here I am as a stunt double in a movie you may remember called Dune. I helped do those patterns. This is the female suit and look at my hair. So uh, yeah, yeah, Brillo pad hair at that point. I could slick that down and do stuff with it. In fact, I stunt doubled for Sean Young. I was in the hot Mexican desert while she was in a coal trailer having a pina colada or something. And then this is what I mean by a body cast, okay? Maybe you everyone doesn't realize, but here is the actor having a body cast done. And I'm on the, you know, you can see all of us working right there to cast the actor, do a bodysuit. And then we made a replica of his body and that's how we made the still suit. And I took the body cast of Sting. I have a great story about that. So if you want to hear that Sting story, uh, post it in the comments and I'll, I'll further elaborate. It's pretty funny when I met him. But anyway, so like I said, this is why we get back to Cruella de Vil. Why when you see the previews of things, guys, from Star Wars to Harry Potter to anything, and it's not really that savory to you, give them a break. A grain of salt. Okay. So it is, I've now been yet, <laughs> I've now been talking for a while. So let's go over to your comments and hear what you have to say. And then I'll come back to these questions because we don't want Leo to feel like he's working his poor little behind off getting your questions together and then me ignoring him. Okay. We don't want him to feel that way. So, but let's look at your comments because it's always fun to go and see you. And I noticed that if I go to you in the middle of the broadcast, many of you really like that. So uh, I hope you do. Oh, thank you, Janny. Janny is an amazing artist. Good morning, fellow Terry fans. Yeah, Bob Burdine is wonderful. Bob Burdine got his second vaccine. Isn't that cool? Hello, Jeremy. Welcome. Buster Balloon, hello, villains. woo I mean... I don't usually get excited about live action trailers. You guys know this who have been with me for a while. I don't like them, except for Cinderella, the original Cinderella, Kenneth Branagh, because Kenneth Branagh gets it, okay? You need to let Kenneth Branagh direct more of these live action ones because the man is brilliant. He has real depth. Maybe it's because of his love for Shakespeare. I don't know. I'm not even going to speculate on that, but that's a brilliant director right there. And I miss him. Uh, here's Bonnie. Bonnie says, good morning. Don't worry. I am answering the questions for a while. So you are here and it's great to see you. Great to see you as well. Adam Robinson. Hello, Adam. And Adam, we are on the, the tribe today. We were talking about possibly having an 11 o'clock Zoom call. So what am I talking about, everyone? I have a Patreon page and uh, for $5 a month, you can be a part of it. Before I come here and talk publicly, I do a private session, a uh, Facebook live session with the tribe on Patreon Mondays and Fridays. And then on Wednesday, we do a Zoom call. But I have people across the pond in the UK and we were talking about pushing back the Zoom call. I usually do it at 9 a.m. And we're pushing it back to uh, 11 a.m. or pushing it up, I guess, so the people in London can join us. They would be off work. They can have a coffee. They can have dinner. And the idea is to eat and share a yummy thing. That's what it's called. You know, tea with cherry or co lovely coffee chat or whatever you want to bring. And we have food and we chat and people have... Uh, people do a uh, 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 spotlight. We put you in the spotlight if you're part of Terry's Tribe. I'm going to just do a little shout out. This is it. Patreon.com slash Terry Harden if you want to check it out. No obligation, but your voice is something we would love to hear there. I know some of you don't think that, 
but uh, your voices, all the voices that are in the tribe are very, very much loved and respected and everybody helps each other. If you're someone who is challenged by the pandemic or you wanted to try some art or you want to try anything new, or you are really good at what you do, everybody shares on the private Facebook page and then also on the Zoom call. And it is delightful. I will say full disclosure, originally when I did this Patreon page, I didn't know what it was going to be. But as things work, it just grows and grows with some amazing people involved with their voices and they talk about what's important to them. And it's a really nice, warm, safe environment. And it's a nice, safe environment because it's private. So you can say a couple of things that maybe might not resonate on a public channel privately because we all know you and we all get it. So if you're interested in adding your voice to this, $5 a month is where the tier starts. It is a membership site. And for $5 a month, you get all of that yummy stuff. And then there's tiers that are higher, but there's no obligation to be in the higher tiers unless you want to be, okay? But most are here. This is, you know, the $5 tier is fine. And I appreciate your helping me. It allows me to do the Facebook Lives on Mondays and Fridays with commitment. And it also allows me when we open up again and, at, and go live, it allows me to go to clubs and to places like at-risk kids and pay for the flight myself because of, the, of all of you helping me on Patreon. That's how I pay for the flight so that they don't have to. And we really need to reach out to our youth, don't we? And I speak to them about diversity. I speak to them. I speak to young people about why they have the right to, to make a living doing what they love. They deserve it. Because you can always say, I'm going to teach you how to make a living doing what you love, right? But I think a lot of people want to know that they deserve to take that path. Because they're not always, you're not always told, are you, that you have the right to do what you love. You have the right to pursue that. It may take some time and it might be hard, but this is what I'm telling children and young people today. Uh, you know, high school, I like uh, K through 12 a lot, but I also talk to colleges because in college, sometimes you don't even know what your elective is. So this is my favorite thing is to do this. And a lot of times budget in K through 12 is limited. We all know that, right? And little clubs that get together for Disney or whatever are limited. So patrons, my tribe, helps me to take care of those people who are less fortunate in being able to, to pay my fee. Because as a speaker, you can, you know, you pay my fee, woohoo, but I like to get out to everybody. So that's what this is about. Uh, no pressure, but uh, the tribe is amazing. And uh, for just $5 a month, you get, you get Facebook lives, your private Facebook lives, a private Facebook page and a Zoom call every week. And then I send you a little gift for Christmas and we have all kinds of cool stuff happening. I mean, it just keeps the, the hit parade. It is the hit parade. Okay. So there you go. So uh, here we are. What did you do on Dune? Was it costumes? Yeah. Okay. So Dune was an amazing film. Well, was it an amazing film? <laughs> David Lynch's. Uh, Dune. I actually worked alongside Frank Herbert, the writer of Dune. He was there. And the idea originally behind Dune was that we were supposed to, and I'm going to show you the picture again while I talk to you about it. We were supposed to do three movies, but the De Laurentiis had a hold of it. Do you remember Dino De Laurentiis? He did Conan the Barbarian with Arnold Schwarzenegger and a plethora of other films, as did his daughter, Raffaella. Well, Raffaella got a hold of this and she took all of the stuff that Frank Herbert had originally got together for three films in Dune and made it one film. So if you watched it and said, I have no idea what's happening, you weren't alone because between the time we filmed, built and shot, she changed her mind about what the movie was going to be. And Frank Herbert was livid. So angry. So that's why a lot more people are thinking about doing their versions of Dune because a lot of stuff went on set and there were definitely some wonderful moments with Dune. Uh, Ali, is it Alia of the Knife? Oh, she was so good. 
so good. Lovely people in this film. And there was some really great stuff. Kyle McLaughlin. And um, I was trying to see if I had a Kyle McLaughlin battle um, uh, shot. Because usually I do. So that I could show you one of the challenges of who, who knows the workings of costumes and then those who don't. But to answer your question, Danny, yes, I built the costumes. That's how I was originally brought in. And then I was small, like Sean Young, who played, of course, the lead. And they saw that I could fit the outfit. So they flew me down to Mexico to run around. So all those running scenes are me as Sean. And it was hotter than... <laughs> and the ensemble, you know, those scenes. So we did... Back then, there was no CG, okay, guys? No computer generated. So everybody you see are people. What was it? Like, was it, was it Spartacus that you can see the watches in the ensemble? Cause it's all people. Anyway, college guys. And if you, if you stop it, you can see that they were wearing watches. So there's all kinds of stuff like that happening. Like the uh, Game of Thrones Starbucks cup, if you will. But uh, they, all the ensemble was in Mexico and they paid everybody in Mexico two pairs of shoes to do Dune. That's what they paid them, which is one of the reasons we were down in Mexico. Don't be offended. Those Mexican people were really happy to get those shoes and they got some really nice shoes, but kind of weird, huh? Yeah, I thought so. I thought a little strange, a little weird. Thank you for asking that question, Jenny. That was a good one. Good morning, Ab Adam. Indeed. So yes, let me know. Uh, if that call sounds good, I'm going to be sending it out later. Morning again, Deanna. So the people who are saying again were with me earlier on that. There's always time to finish everything in post. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then sometimes no. Sometimes post changes it. So I spoke about Country Bears earlier and how Country Bears changed from being about uh, the bears to about the people and the bears and the movie suffered for it, I think. Even that being said, when it went to video, and I'm speaking the country bears now, when it went to video, it became the number five most rented film for families. So it still did very well. In fact, so much so we almost did a sequel. Really would have loved to have done that. But back to Dune, Dune was one of those that a lot of people like and they love, but it was cut like crazy. Hours of footage, it was on the floor. In fact, laser discs, and you've heard me speak of laser discs before, big round, looked like vinyl, rainbow, very beautiful. Uh, There's a big, huge set about this thick of laser discs that had a lot of the footage that was on the cutting room floor. I think it came out of Tokyo. A lot of that stuff comes out of Tokyo. But anyway, yeah, sometimes post can be poison. Post can be poison. Another fact is Monkey Bone. You may not even heard about this film, but Monkey Bone was supposed to mostly take place in Comatown, which is where all the puppets and all the characters and all the weird stuff happened. But when they saw the footage, they changed their mind and they made it about the people and it really destroyed the film. In my opinion, you really should have stayed in Comatown because Comatown was where the cool was. What do you think of, Michael asks, what do you think of Disney firing Gina Carano, Cara Dune? Oh my gosh, this broke my heart. This broke my heart. But if you saw some of the things she posted, see, this is why I say, guys, read your posts two or three times before you upload them to your uh, social media platform of choice. And also watch what you say. I love this woman. This woman had her own, uh, a contract to do an own movie deal. She was going to, she, she just, I love her. I love her. But in today's world, you really have to carefully watch what you say. And unfortunately, and I'm going to say it this way. Maybe she didn't mean it to sound like it sounded, but that's what I'm saying. You got to read what you're going to email, read what you're going to post, read what you're going to send, because we don't have this to go by. If I say a certain thing and you can read my face and see the manner in which it's given, you're safe, aren't you? But when you're writing stuff, when you're texting stuff, I know this to be true because I have a wonderful lady in Newfoundland, Canada, that I just love. Her name is Bonnie. And I sent her a text. This is years ago. And she got so offended. And I had no idea. What did I write? 
spell check had shifted. I don't even know what happened, but it hurt her so much that she's never been the same, even though I told her that that was not what I wrote. That was not what I wrote. Stupid spell check. But, but I had, I had some real fences to mend because I love this woman. She's a brilliant woman. I would never say anything like that. And then in my heart, I was like, do you really think I would say something like that? And she said, no, that's why it hurt so much. So I, I have done this privately with a friend or two. And it's because the words don't read like I think they are being said. So this right here, if that's the case for Gina, my heart goes out to her. If she actually believes some of the things she wrote, then I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We got to be careful, guys. We, we, we are not. It doesn't matter how famous you are and how well-known you are. You still put your pant legs on one leg at a time like humans. COVID can still get you. Nobody is above anybody else. They might have interesting careers or fun things, but we're all on the same plane. Human beings who should care about each other and think about each other's feelings and their safety. That's what really matters, you know? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question, Michael. I think she's doing her all from what I've seen. Well, you know, Adam, I really, I don't know what Disney's going to do. I mean, she's got a lot of fences to mend and having been a fence mender myself, it's not an easy path. But I, I, if, if she feels that she made a serious mistake, then, then uh, don't quit. Don't quit, my dear. Do whatever it takes to let people know that's not what you meant if that is the case. That is my feeling because I love her. She was my favorite character. And uh, that's it. Great pull with falling down. I think more recent example is the more recent Bridge to Terabithia where it was marketed as a fantasy adventure film, but the actual film was an adolescent drama that deals with child death. So trailers don't actually reflect the final film. Adam, this is exactly what I'm saying. They don't reflect the final film. Why? Because they're not given the footage to do it the way they, they aren't even told many cases. Uh, a trailer teaser creator isn't even told what the movie is actually about nowadays. They have to kind of deduce it from what they've got before them in the cuts. True story. Why? Because they don't want it getting out on social media. They don't want it to escape. And you know, some of you out there, uh, some people, maybe not you, but you know people who are love to give you the spoilers, right? Good grief. They love to do those spoilers. And you're just like, hey, man, what? And that's what I say. So late again, but I'm here now. I missed you. It's been a long week. Angie, you said a mouthful, sweetie. Glad to have you. Adam says the real cardinal sin, all the bias towards the original animated film, as well as the live action remakes with Glenn Close as Cruella. I'm a very open-minded person. And we've previously established, as we previously established, I didn't necessarily have a problem with many of the recent adaptations because that's why they are not remakes. And I'm very excited to see what direction the new films go. Yeah. Well, uh, and I agree with you, Adam, to a certain extent, but there are some films just should be left alone like Dumbo. They should have never made Dumbo. They should have never done it. I couldn't even bring myself to watch it. And then what's up with Lion King live action? I mean, really guys, really? You're going to, you're going to not watch the animated feature to watch computer animated animals. And Rafiki is my favorite character, but have you seen real baboons? I mean, I sculpt animals. That's one of my main things that I do for uh, my own art is sculpting animals. That means I study animals. So have you seen the way baboons are? They're not really friendly. <laughs> so this is why a challenge, you know, was made in the Lion King and they're doing another one. And I just go, please stop. Don't, don't do another one. So Adam, I have to uh, disagree. But then this is my my history and my background, okay? I really don't like what 
you know, the Maleficent was really, really offensive to me. And uh, the first one, it felt like, it felt like when they cut her wings off, like rape. And that just could not get that out of my head. I absolutely hated it. I absolutely thought it was horrible. I thought it was a horrible thing. And I just did not understand how a film, Disney could allow such a film, could allow such a story to unfold. You know, that need to be, that in my opinion, that needed to be reworked. So straight on serious, but Cruella looks really good. So uh, I'm excited to see it because I thought what I saw in the previews looked yummy. I hope they don't disappoint me. When I saw the trailer, so Disney is going to show WB their version of Harlequin. You know, Ron, this is exactly what my husband said. And then he showed me, like I said earlier, the side-by-side -side of the trailer, teaser trailer for Joker with Joaquin. And the, I mean, with, uh, not Joaquin, but the, the trailer for Joker and then the trailer for Cruella and they parallel. And that was pretty wild. That was really, really wild. That blew me away. That just blew me away when I saw it and the music with it. And then everybody said, it's Harlequin, it's Harlequin. So you're right. But seriously, looks good. She's going to continue being a villain, unlike Maleficent in live action. Yeah. Unfortunately for poor Maleficent, she came out around the time that they did uh, Wicked. And Wicked was a great play. I thought it was wonderful, but not all villains need to reform. We like villains that stay villains. Darth Vader, oh my gosh. When Darth Vader changed and the, you know, in Jedi, it was like wanting to throw up, you know, just leave him bad. I like villains who like to stay bad, you know? Uh, so I just, yeah, I'm with you, Ron. Good morning, Michelle B. How are you? Yes, all of the Catwoman outfit, says Janny. Yeah, so so the Catwoman outfit, I will see if I can show you the gloves and stuff. Uh, I will uh, make sure that uh, I'm reminded of that. I'll give a shout out to Leo and, and remind you of that. So uh, yeah, stay puff. Let's go. Yo, Matt, are you surprised? I have to tell you. Uh, stay puff was made. Thank you for the question, Sharon. Uh, Stay Puffed is, he is a base of what we call L200 foam. This is an amazing foam. And I really thought in my photos, I really thought I had pictures of, let me just go to the bottom. Maybe they're all in the bottom. Because I would really love to show you the, the parts that make the, oh, here we go. Here's a few. Okay, just for you, Miss Sharon. We're going to show you a little bit of Marshmallow Man, okay? So where am I going to take you? First, I'm going to take you to the drawing, okay? Here's the drawing of the Marshmallow Man. Um, the Marshmallow Man had this cute little sketch, and then my friend Billy, who is in the suit, made this prototype, so this prototype here from Ghostbusters is the one he made first. And those are his hands poking out the side. That's him wearing it. And this is all mattress foam, meaning the stuff that you find in your couch. He does have an understructure under there. This he did very quickly. He is an expert when it comes to materials like this. And uh, just, just so much fun. So here's how we made it. Because Shell and Sharon, I'm going to leave you... What, what, what is it made of? So people know if you're joining us later and you're like, what is she saying? I'm answering questions based on the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. And we're showing pictures. So there you go. Now you're all caught up. Okay, so here is some of the filming stuff and I'll show you all of how it works. So I'm going to show you this picture right here. And... Here are the components of the Marshmallow Man, Sharon. And so first is L200. It is a wonderful foam material that when you do those little, like, you know, the earth, when they make it flat, this is kind of the same process. Next to it, you see that gray shape. That is fireproof material. 
and underneath it's painted with a fireproof material on top of that. Because as you know, and look at all of the ghost, look at all of the Marshmallow Man arms just above your name, Sharon. And then next to it are the pattern pieces. So we were making Marshmallow Man, Marshmallow Man, Marshmallow Man. We had to do 18 burning Marshmallow Man, 15 burning Marshmallow Man, and three heroes. Hero suits means the ones that the actor bill bryant is in and so here are and do i have the one where it's hanging i don't see the one where all of the outfits are hanging i was kind of hoping i could show you that one but i don't see it so here is one where we're actually working on the suits and you see my hair there that's my friend bart and uh you can see, I don't know if you can see, but you can see he's working on the cutting part of it and I'm assembling, all right? And in the back behind him is a black bag. That's because the Marshmallow Man needed to stay white, 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 and the foam yellows. So we couldn't do that. And then uh, I will show you the... Then we would take the white pristine foam and all of us would stretch it over the body. So you've got several of us here. Bill is the one next to me. I'm the one in the cowboy hat. And then next to me in the vest is Bill. He's the one who wears the marshmallow man. And then down below is Mark Tyler. He's the one pulling down. And then next to him is Eric Fiedler. So all of us are stretching this 100 PPI foam, meaning points, pounds per square, making it a very nice, soft, stretchy. We've spray glued it, and then we're stretching it, okay? And the idea was to make it so that if it was shot from the front, the zipper was in the back. If it was shot three quarters, the zipper was in the side. And if it was shot from the back, the zipper was in the front. Making the Marshmallow Man, Mr. Stay Puff, look nice and pristine. No zipper, no harm, no foul. Right? Aren't we clever? <laughs> so now I'm going to show you some shots of Billy. I think you need to see some shots of Billy because he looks so cute. Here's a beautiful color photo of Bill Bryant standing in front of a blue screen. And there he is in the actual Marshmallow Man suit. Now we are actually underneath the floor performing the face articulation. So we're making him go, ah, or, or all of that, those facial looks, but ah, you know, you've seen the movie. Uh, next to it, I am standing next to Bill. The mouth is open. This is what happens with suit performers in between takes when we cannot remove the head. And so I am actually mining, minding uh, air tube that is giving cool air to Billy while uh, he is waiting to shoot his next walking sequence. And then I'll jump under the floor and articulate the face. But this is resting Marshmallow Man face, which allows him to have air come in there. And then I have a tube. You can't see it, but my hand that's down is the uh, tube. And then here is Billy. This is a really great shot of Bill Bryant with the head off and you see he's reading. Can you see he's reading a book? He had an entire library in the belly of the Marshmallow Man so that he could just kind of relax and read in between. That's uh, something that's just you, you few that are watching it right now, that's a little secret. And you see his head is on the C stand next to him. So that head has air going up so that uh, when he puts it on, it's not yucky. And then uh, the cables coming down from it. I don't know if you can see that. But those cables are what help the head to articulate. Each goes to a feature like eyes and mouth. And then he, Billy does the walking and the back and forth like this. And then we do all the rest. Here is the forced perspective of the Marshmallow Man. So when the Ghostbusters are looking down over the building where Gozer the Gazarian is... And they look to see the scary um, uh, marshmallow man. These arms are actually three and a half feet long. And the body is a half body. So we puppeteered it by laying on the floor. And then it's the forced perspective going at you. Rah! That's what that's from. That's what that's all about right there. All that ghost 
stuff. All of that marshmallow man. Yeah. And then here is a melted, and that's the fire suit. So this is the melted bottom after the fire. Yeah. And then you saw that one with a stretching. And then if I go this way, you get a picture of all the Ghostbusters. Uh, the shot, this is a cyclorama behind that of New York. And then here are our famous Ghostbusters acting below and reacting. And all of the people you see standing in the foreground are gaffers, uh, um, director, uh, assistant, production assistant, stand-ins, just all of the important people that are supposed to be in that shot. And then here I am at the top. This is Team Terror Dog. Many, I did a terror dog. I played the one that Sigourney Weaver turns into. And here I'm 40 feet in the air. The harness that I'm wearing, I hung over an open 40 feet in the air while performing the dog that Gozer the Gazarian pets. There I am. And then here's my dog getting ready to go to set without his little horns. And... There's the librarian ghost. I was on that team. Puppeteers get together. Now, here is an example of the zipper I was telling you. So here's the three-quarter back suit, and the zipper is three-quarters in the front. So that kind of gets you an idea of what some of the things you have to do. Here I am with my dog, and you see my harness. So there I am with my dog, and then I'm just sort of standing, and we're doing all kinds of fun stuff. Here, the head's being put on by D Diana Williams. And I'm just sort of looking on while she's helping either him in it or out of it. And uh, I'm making sure that the tube's going up into Billy while Diana does all the finishing touches. This is the Ghostbuster group. Yeah. Okay. So you saw it. Oh, picture of my dog. Okay. All right. So there you have it. That's how you make it. It's made out of... Uh, mattress foam, but it's a high quality mattress foam. Most mattress foams are 35 PPI or 35 points per square inch, which means you can actually fill the little bubbles that are pressed together to make the stuff that's in your couch. Okay. This was a hundred PPI, meaning a hundred pounds of pressure per square inch, which makes the little bubbles non-existent. It's like super soft, almost like memory foam. If you guys know those beds that you lay on, that have that cool memory foam. That's kind of what is happening with the stretchy and it makes it super stretchy. Uh, so it makes it a very, very cool um, outfit. I was going to show you a couple of more things you might enjoy. Uh, Bill, in the movie, what happens with people who are in effects and who are also builders is that we hide things on the set. So in Close Encounters, the main mothership in Close Encounters was built by an amazing guy named Greg Jean, brilliant model maker. Greg hid things on the mothership like a tiny, teeny, tiny R2-D2, tiny little elements in there that you needed to try and find. And it just hasn't stopped. This is kind of a tradition with people in film. They, 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 so if you slow it down, you can find things like a mailbox, like R2-D2, like, you know, things stuck on the mothership that are <laughs> not supposed to be there. So if you're a Close Encounters fan and you want to check it out, you know, put in that DVD and and you'll see it during the mothership when it swings by. And uh, the same happens if you were at Galaxy's Edge, of course, before Disneyland closed. You'll know that there's a spot underneath the Millennium Falcon that's a teeny tiny Millennium Falcon. So <laughs> they're still doing it. We're still doing all that crazy wild stuff so you guys can find a little Easter egg no matter where you are. So this picture here is such an Easter egg. The Marshmallow Man walks down the boulevard and steps on various objects. Here, the Marshmallow Man steps on a car. Well, in this particular car are all of the Marshmallow Man team. Me, my friend Linda, Billy, everybody. We took Polaroids, which are, the, do you remember a camera? And it was in this film, you had to warm it up and it makes, and then we cut the people out. So here is Linda laying in the street, all squished. And then the rest of us are all throughout the car. And you may not be able to find us, but we're all inside the car. I think it's me back here. You see that kind of fuzzy head back there. But 
uh, we were all in the police car, all mushed. And here she is in the crosswalk. She was a good lady. She walked in the crosswalk, but she still got mushed. So that's one of the things we hit, we had. And then um, Mark Stetson, who did a lot of really cool models, he did a truck on the street that had pods in it from body snatchers. And it said, you're next on the side. Yeah. And then he had a van that said Stetson visual arts, you know, so you have to slow those things down because if they're seen on the big screen intentionally, then the production will make you take them out. So you got to make sure that you're clever when you hide that stuff. Um, but it's a lot of fun for people, you know, for your fans and things for people to look at. So um, I thought you would enjoy that. And then here's Bill out of the suit. So here he is in his nice little green, um, green giant uh, tights. And he's smiling. And as Diana and various people, Tyler, me and my cowboy hat, and my overalls, as he's taking his break in between. So, um, but he was the inside of the Marshmallow Man. And then the rest of the people you see there, we were doing this, but then we also doubled as puppeteers on the face. So um, that's how that all works. That's how that all, that's how the magic works, guys. You know, and let me show you, here we are underneath doing the, uh, the puppeteering. So you see the monitor in the foreground, Diane's looking back in front of me is Mark. And then there's me looking back and they, the bar you see that's crossing over, that's the bar that pushes us forward so that uh, we can follow the cables that are coming up through the street as the Marshmallow Man, Billy Bryant, walks forward. So there you go. I don't know if you felt like... Sharon, that's all the answers you needed, but there you go. And then one other thing I'll, I'll share with you. This was sent to me by my dear friend, Thomas. Uh, this is a variety ad. And what happened was that production found a loophole and they left a lot of our names out of the credits. And I have this somewhere, but I didn't know where it was. I just can't find it. But this is all of the names of the people that were left out of the credits on Ghostbusters. So the cool thing is, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Um, my friend Bart Daniels, who is no longer with us, he's the other guy that was working with me so effectively. But if I pull it up here, maybe you can see it. Can you see my name? Do you see my name there? It's right there under Ben Holler. Let's see if I've got it right. There it is. Ben Holler and Alan Harding. So about eight names above Jerry Jeffries, who's in capital letters. But this is proof positive that I actually was on the ghost the Richard Edland and the effects group boss films, all of us for Ghostbusters and then the insignia on the back and down here for memorial service above and beyond for Ghostbusters. So let me get my little self out of there so that you can see it, right? And meeting an impossible deadline. Boy, weren't they not kidding. Thank you for that question. <laughs> you didn't know it was going to be such a well elaborate one, did you? Yeah, I'm here and sent you plenty of questions. Yes, you did. And, you know, I'm not going to ignore them. I promise. I promise. I will get to them. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we want to see Yoda, too. If I can find him, I will do that. Okay? I promise to do that. But as Leo says, it is getting towards pushing 11. And I should look at some of these questions. I mean, I should do these questions that... Leo did because he worked very hard to do this. So let's take a look at it. Uh, what did I think about the WandaVision episode that dropped last Friday? You know how I feel about WandaVision, guys. I love my WandaVision. But why do I love my WandaVision? It's because uh, they think of me. I'm as important to them as uh, you uh, Marvelites are. And so I actually get to watch WandaVision with my husband. And that's what I love about it. And this last one, I found myself really involved. No, don't. 
was what I, so, so it was a lot like my, the birds moment. I love Alfred Hitchcock, the birds. And remember, uh, I will not give spoilers. If you have not yet seen this, uh, uh, go watch it. You're going to love it. And then watch it every week. Okay. We think there's what, three more left. That was episode six. We're hoping that I think there's like nine. My husband was thinking maybe there's nine or 10 episodes. Maybe you guys know. But uh, as long as it's running, I won't do spoilers. But there was a moment for me where I was just like Tippy. Tippy Hedrum hears that in the birds. After all of the havoc happens, she's going to go upstairs now. She's going to open the door and you're screaming, no, no. Well, this was my WandaVision moment. No, 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 no. I was freaking out. So really uh, unemotional. And, and my husband said that he thought the reason I like WandaVision is because it's, uh, let me see if I get this right, because it wasn't the case. Oh, I'm trying to remember. But let me just say why. I like it because of the sacrificial love story, the, the, the love story. Okay, it's a love story. Wanda has created this world because of, of her love. Okay. And you have me at hello with that. And I don't think that's a spoiler. Is that a spoiler guys? Cause I don't think it is. Um, I asked my husband only what I need to know because I'm not a Marvelite. I don't need the backstory. I don't need to know when, where, and how in the comic book. I don't need to know the issue. I don't need to know all of that detaily stuff. I just want to know why does she have a last name and people call her the Scarlet Witch. And my husband said Scarlet Witch. And then in Ultron, they say her name. And before that, they say her name. So here they say her name. Stop. For me. That's all I need. Okay. So when I first saw this series, I didn't, I thought Vision, because I had seen Vision in Endgame. And I thought, thank you, Adam. Um, I saw, I saw Vision in 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 Endgame, and I thought he was an alien. I didn't realize he was an android. So my husband said Vision is an android, and I love Vision. I think Vision is amazing. I love Wanda too. I think I think she's really super cool too. And when I first saw Wanda, I think I mentioned this the last AMA. I thought she could her power was to throw fire, and that is a power, but that's not her only power. So my husband said, No, no, no. She can do fire and a whole lot more. And I said, Stop. That's all I need to know. You know, so the the Marvelites want to know the Easter eggs. The Marvelites want to know the backstory. The Marvelites want to know where is everything. And I don't want to know all that. I just want to follow the, the love story. And it's not because I don't, it's not because it's just not my thing. Superheroes are not my thing. This is the first real opportunity for me to really get involved with, with superheroes that I've seen because I've gone to these movies with my husband and at some point fallen asleep. Uh, but but uh, it's just, you know, it's like Star Wars is 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 a movie that I love, but not, I mean, luckily my husband likes Star Wars too. But there are movies that I really get into that my husband just doesn't, like Evan Almighty. I just love Evan Almighty. And he's like, <sighs> so it's a taste thing. But I'm really excited to be able to share this because this is a big thing for my husband. He loves Marvel and DC and all of that superhero stuff. He loves it. And it whoosh, over me, except for Rocket from Guardians of the Galaxy and the blue guy with the fin. And I like those and Groot. Uh, I like those just because they get my heart. You know, they just touch my heart. But that's unusual. OK, so anyway, so that's what I love about WandaVision. I just think it's super, super cool. And I never can wait. I just can't wait till Saturday. So today's Friday and of course WandaVision drops, but we won't watch it today because my husband works. So once my husband gets home, tomorrow will be the day that we curl up and watch WandaVision or we'll curl up and watch. I usually make a nice breakfast and then he pulls it up and then we watch it together. And sometimes we watch it twice just to make sure we saw what we saw. 
And thank you, Disney Plus, because I think it's brilliant. And thank you to the producers and creators of WandaVision, to all the actors, to all the performers, to everyone on that show for making it something for me to watch. And others have stated a chance for them to bond with the Marvelites because we it, it was something that really eluded us, really. It just wasn't our jam. And um, we really crack up. My husband went on YouTube shortly after last week and i actually saw how in-depth you marvelites get oh my gosh listening to it made my ears hurt but uh i simply got off and made some i got up and made some sweet rolls so my husband could watch it in peace and uh, when i came back he was done so we we work on it because we respect each other but I need to know just the littlest simple story, but I love to sit with them and I'm like this. And every once in a while, because my point of view is different on WandaVision than his, I'll come up with a theory and he'll be like, hey, that might be something. So anyway, watch it. You're going to love it. Uh, Disney also did the first trailer for Cruella. Um what did you think? And the casting of Emma Stone. Well, I think we've touched base on that because I came out like a lion with that. I think she's just great. I think, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't it Emma Stone who did the Mary Poppins? Am I wrong with that? I didn't like that Mary Poppins. Yeah. Julie Andrews all the way. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's see. What do you think about the film apparently set in 1980s punk rock scene in Britain? I don't know. We'll see. Won't we? Open book. You, you picked Cruella. You have Dalmatians. Any, you have the elements that I like, right? You have the elements that I like. Um, let's see. Uh, Disney Studios has a new animated film, Ray and the Last Dragon, coming March 5th. Uh, yeah, I talked about this last Friday too. I think the dragon looks a little der derivative. Do you remember those books when you were a kid called Serendipity? Little derivative of that. I don't know. You know, people say nothing is new in the world. So maybe they didn't, you know, go, ooh, I like that dragon copy it. I don't think they did that, but it might've been in their childhood. Maybe they watched Serendipity and they saw this beautiful dragon, but that's the first thing I saw was, oh my goodness, it looks like the Serendipity dragon. It looks like it could be a lot of fun, but this next one, uh, would I pay $30? Nah, that ain't happening, guys. That's not gonna happen. And they're talking about not even dropping it in Disney Plus, this is the latest thing I heard. Maybe I'm wrong. They're going to do it in theaters. But here in California, we don't have theaters open. So uh, maybe in March that'll change. But right now there are no movie theaters open. So I don't know if that's going to work. You know, um, at least this $30, if you really want to see it first, they'll get them something because they've invested a lot to create these films. They're not, you know, you know how much films cost. So they got to recoup their money somehow. But uh, we just aren't going to movie theaters, are we? They're closed. Yeah, they're they're locked up. Uh, but I love it. Uh, it, it, it. It's asked here, are you excited since Disney's film's about a dragon? And the dra I do like that. I do like that it's about a dragon. And it's about sort of a reluctant dragon, isn't it, from what I saw from the previews? And that's pretty cute. I, I, yeah, I mean, hello if it's in a dragon. Pete's dragon. Um, anything dragon, I'm, I'm all about the dragons. So, so yeah. Uh, but I won't pay $30. No, no, won't be doing that. Um, don't even care. Um, Disney plus has a lot of yummy things <laughs> that you can see that I don't, that I don't have to pay that extra money. Have you seen the uptick in requests for podcasters and others wanting to interview you? Any information about how well dinosaurs is doing on Disney plus haven't heard how well Dis dinosaurs is doing on Disney plus, but a lot of you have written to me and told me how much you love it and how it holds up. I think so too. It's a really great show. Uh, and a lot of people are sharing, sharing it with their children. And I love that too. I got a question the other day about Switched at Birth, which is the episode where there are two babies, a green baby and a, yeah, uh, and baby Sinclair. And, uh, and that's a really fun episode. And they were wondering who did the other baby, who performed the other baby. So if you have questions like that, who performed the other baby, what's it take to do that? That looks hard. That looks easy. How do they work? What kind of system do you use? This is all Jim Henson stuff. 
So we can easily share it with you. Just ask the question. Okay. Uh, but uh, lots of, of, of requests from um, Wednesday, Tuesday, three different situations. And then one of them was Ghostbusters because Ghostbusters has got another one coming out. I don't know when. I don't know when. I'm not in it. I want to do. My agent tried. No luck there, but you know, whatever. Uh, but I did this, um, I did this wonderful thing with my friend, Thomas Henry. And uh, I did a signing. I actually met very well social distanced, very safe and careful. But I went and look at the gifts that he gave me, the Ghostbusters team. So this is... Um, the effects patch that actually was in um, the Boss Film Corporation. This is a replica that this group has done. And old Captain EO button, you remember these guys? When you went to see Captain EO, that was given to me by uh, Tom Tom's friend, Matt, who knew I was a big Captain EO person. And then um, it's not a job, it's a calling. These are stickers that they made. Aren't they cute? And look, okay, who bought the who brought the dog? So that's in honor of me. And then here's their new sticker right here. This is the group. This is their logo. Isn't it cute? And they do autographs. So they and I autographed. Yeah. And then I don't know. I'm gonna show you Slimer, but there's one I'm not sure I can show yet. So I'll show this one. Isn't this one cute? But they all have pens, and now they're doing they're doing a temple dog in honor of me and my character. And then they have uh, these baseball cards with them on the back, and they're called the Containment Unit. So www. the Containment Unit or the Containment Unit on YouTube or the Containment Unit on Facebook, and they created these uh, these lovely. Uh, lobby cards of me as the monster dog here and then my name down here isn't that lovely yeah terror dog terry that's my dog that's my dog right there yay anyway i thought you'd like to see this stuff because this is one of the podcasts that i did and um i was notified that i broke the record on signatures so i stood and signed my hand off and uh uh people paid um for the signature and then i just signed a bunch and it was just a great day but i love doing the podcasts people ask podcasts for dinosaurs ghostbusters or just what's up doc what's next you know so that's the situation there and uh so to answer your question yes indeedy uh days of our lives footage yeah i haven't found that yet but that's the one with the spiders so days of our lives is a soap opera and i did a character called will and i don't think i have pictures of will here but will was about four years old and he was too young to do the body cast so if you've been watching this this broadcast today and you saw the body cast of me doing the actor below sting when we were talking about dune uh, they wanted to do a head cast of a little boy. He was only four, his, 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 the actor that played Will. And they were very afraid that that poor child would get claustrophobic. So I had to sculpt a likeness of him in clay and we made a puppet. But if you remind me, I will make sure that book is closer to me so that I can show you that next Friday or maybe even Monday, you know. Um, Texas has been hit with a major cold snap. Can you believe it? Oh my gosh. What's the longest you've ever gone without power? I'm without power now. Oh no, that's not what you mean. <laughs> uh, I don't know how long I've gone without power, but I will tell you that we had a, a big power outage one time when I was on a deadline, a sculpting deadline, and the, the whole house shook and darkness fell and we got candles and we got flashlights and things like that and i felt like it was god saying terry take a break and um my stepson ian 
And my husband and I looked, opened up the window of the front window and we watched the lightning because it was the one time California had lightning, thunder and lightning. And we just sat there until the power came back on and watched thunder and lightning. But that's, that's the thing I remember most about a power outage. That's just about it. I don't think I've ever been in a situation where food could go bad or one could freeze. So uh, because I, I, in California, but the thing about Texas is that Texas is like Southern California. They were not ready. You know, they, they, they don't wrap pipes. They don't get that cold. As we spoke earlier, we don't know how, you know, you're dog paddling. What, what do we do? How do we do it? And so, yeah, it was very scary. In fact, I have a lot of dear friends in Texas and they were telling me no internet, no power. In fact, uh, Tim Gillette, who visits us here regularly on this channel, he'll come and, and pop in and say hello. He's in Texas. And he said that he would get power for like an hour and a half. And then he was notified that they were going to sh shut it off. And you had to try to do your best for the next three hours to stay warm. So Texas did try to notify everybody if they were going to cut the power, but it wasn't necessarily an easy thing. And if your pipes burst, did you see the ceiling fan with icicles or the fish frozen fish tank? Poor fish, you know? So this was a real devastating blow to them. And I'm, I wish them all the best and hope that they can warm up soon because this is really scary. You know, this is a very scary thing when you're not prepared. I mean, wouldn't you say if you're from Philadelphia, New York, where you get snow, that you, you know what a frozen pipe is, you know how to protect your pipes and you know how to navigate snow and you know what it means, possible power outage, everything like that. Exactly. So it's, you know, it's like Kauai getting snow. They wouldn't even know what to do. And that was Texas. So I feel for them. We also know you're a major NASA fan. I am. Did you see the landing on Mars? Whoop, whoop. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, that was so cool. Oh, my gosh. It was so cool. Oh, did I say how cool it was? Um, Sorry. I'm just... I'm just beside myself with glee and joy and so happy. So Leo sent me this wonderful picture uh, from the rover. And I thought this was super cool. Look at that. Are you like, look at that. Look at all the color, guys. Look at all the color. I am so, and this, and he sent me this paper which I really appreciate because, because I just look at it and get so excited. I'm too busy dancing to hear what it is. Uh, this is the landing site in Jezero Crater, geologically rich terrain, landfills reaching as far back as 3.6 billion years, could potentially answer important questions in planetary evolution and astrobiology, says NASA's Th Thomas Z uh, Zerbach. Zerbuchen. Eh, who knows how to say that name, right? Um, Mars 2020 project scientist Ken Farley says the Mars community has long coveted the scientific value of sites such as Jezero Crater. The crater sits just north of the planet's equator and once featured a river delta. This makes it prime spot for preserving possible signs of ancient microbio, microbial life. And guys, if you didn't think you felt like 2021, yesterday was the day. Yesterday I saw landing on Mars, everybody at JPL doing the happy dance as I joined with them. And then a flying car that pulled out of the garage, its wings opened up and that sucker flew. There we were, or the plane with all the propellers. Oh my gosh. Now, I'm not too eager to see how people will drive because on ground, they don't drive so well. But it sure was cool to be in the 21st century yesterday, wouldn't you say? Now, there's all kinds of things that make you feel like you're in the 21st century. But this was really, really amazing. Yes, it was. Oh, my gosh. I was just beside myself. I beside myself. If you're joining us now and you're wondering what the heck I'm talking about, this is a picture from the rover. Mars, guys, Mars, the red planet. Isn't that neat? And then last night I went out and couldn't believe how easily I could see Mars next to the moon. 
it was, I could see it was red. I didn't have a telescope or anything. And I stood out there with my dog and just got totally excited. So, uh, yeah, that's me. Um, I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, come on. What's not to love. And then on, on my Instagram, I said, congratulations to them because I was so happy. I said, you know what I said on Instagram? I said, it's cool to be you. That's what I said yesterday. It's cool to be you. NASA slash JPL slash 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 woohoo is basically it. And I own just about every NASA slash JPL patch. I've got that. I just ordered that Mars patch that they were all wearing yesterday because I got to have them all over my space jacket. I'm a space squid. Right? Uh, and yesterday, uh, was it you, Ron Kubala, who sent me the thing about being a in the civilian flight? which I'd love to do. Um, I, there's a lot of people more qualified than me. It's just a dream of mine to be, to see earth from space. And I hope I get to be a part of it. I'm certainly going to research it and put my hat in the ring because if you don't play, you don't win. Right. So that's what that's all about. So, yeah. So uh, you in the role, a knowledgeable fan with this information to him, according to CNN, Perseverance traveled 292.5 million miles on a on a journey that took more than six months. Yeah, and here's the thing, guys. It landed, you land blind. You, you, know, you understand that, right? Somebody said I could have easily landed Perseverance on the moon, but they were thinking they could see. But they they can't. They could not, it had to, there was a reason. You, you couldn't look. It's dangerous. I don't know exactly why it's dangerous, but I kept hearing how dangerous it was. And so maybe you could have landed it had you been flying it, but you've got to protect your eyes, et cetera, et cetera there. Okay, so, so they did a great job. They did it without actually getting to see what they saw until it landed. And what a brilliant little piece of equipment. What a brilliant process. There's gonna, they're gonna fly a helicopter. Nobody's flown a helicopter on Mars, guys. They're going to actually, they have no idea what it's, what the atmosphere is going to be like, how the lift is going to be. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to see this. And neither can they. I mean, here's where I kind of feel kindred spirits with the space program because I'm kind of like, you know, I may not get to see Earth from space. I'm still praying I do, but wow, right? Wow. You know, just a big, this is really amazing. 21st century. I feel like I'm in the future. 2001, here we come. But I felt that way with the space station and with the space shuttle. You know, the day the space shuttle went and came back, I was, I was, I was in tears. I, I got to tell you, I actually got to go to Edwards Air Force, Air Force Base and see it land and see the astronauts work out, walk out at one point. And I couldn't even, I mean, I was completely choked up. If I can find that picture, that's another picture I wish I could find. I was wearing the original Aliens Nostromo hat when I went and saw that. Oh, what a great day. Had a little, oh, I don't even know where that's, you know, sometimes you just don't know where stuff is or, or, um, you know, what hat, oh, just, yeah, yeah, very cool. Very cool. So, uh, Perseverance, uh, Leo says here, Perseverance is perseverance is full of firsts. It is. It really is. Uh, signs of ancient life, first to record sound and fly the helicopter. Um, the most sophisticated rover has built to date, packed agenda for the next few days. It will explore this beautiful crater, Jezero crater, the site of the ancient lake, etc. Also, a woman was very much involved. So a long Gosh, right after Hidden Figures, that movie, I love that movie. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. Right after Hidden Figures, there were some amazing women. And I got to give a little shout out to Josie Katz here. Because Josie took me to an event. I think it was at the Academy Theater down in Beverly Hills, where the Academy Awards are often, um, they show Academy films. <laughs> That's where I saw, saw a lot of screenings of the Star Wars films. But what I'm trying to say is they had actual women of 
NASA and JPL, et cetera, et cetera. There were four or five of them. And they were talking about their involvement in each of the space programs. One of them was the rover that landed on Mars. She's one of the people very much involved in it. And it was a joy to meet them, to hear from them and to see them. And like I said, it's cool to be you. <laughs> so cool to be you. I turned into a super fan. I'm not going to lie. Really cool to talk to these brains, these men and women. And this one was about the women because it was in honor of hidden figures. So, oh, what a great, oh, it was just great. And it was very diverse. All kinds of different, you know, all kinds of different nationalities and stuff. And you saw that yesterday if you watched it, the nationalities of the people involved just on camera. It was just... It's possible, guys. There's no reason for it to be any other way. There it is. Oh, yeah. So cool. Uh, let's see. There's the there's the Ingenuity helicopter. Yeah, I can't wait to see this. It's got onboard cameras, but I want to just see it. They, they said yesterday on the NASA channel that they are, they, they, they've done everything they possibly could, simulated, but they don't know how it's going to be like when they fly so far so good. So we'll stay positive, and I, I can't wait to see that footage. Um, so it's cool. Do you think you'll see a manned mission to Mars in your lifetime? Yeah, I plan to live till 150, so I should be able to see it. Uh, I won't be on it. No, nah, no. Nah. And I don't know about the colonization of Mars, but uh, yeah. In fact, there was, did you hear about the, um, the, the, uh, I was going to use the wrong word. Activist. That's the word I was looking for. The activist who did the commercial about leaving the cruddy planet Earth behind. And if you're super wealthy, you land on Mars. You should see that it's a commercial for it. She's saying that she doesn't think the billions of dollars should be spent on Mars exploration when Earth is really in need. And she has a point, but I'm really glad they still are doing the space program. I think that going out and looking for a couple of answers in some of the planets around us and learning about the surrounding planets could give us answers on how to take care of home. It's not inconceivable. So I'm just really super stoked and excited about it. Uh, so it's cool. And if you're joining us, I'm going to keep saying that because we have, I have been talking for a while. I, uh, I actually started this at nine 25 and it's now 11 19 we've been going uh just under two hours so if you're just joining us we're talking about mars and how much terry loves space so much so let me just um show you how totally stoked i am about space i had this created and i sent it to astronauts so you can't may not be able to see this but this is to celebrate the dragon so this was to celebrate the first uh, manned flight that docked with the space station. And then of course, after that, it was mission one, which I was so excited about. I also, but I made this pin and it congratulates them on the back LTD at 200. My idea was to have some of these in my pocket. And if you tapped me on the shoulder and said, hello, I would give you one. Um, don't know if I'm going to be able to do that, but I am a super squid and you know, how nice of Elon Musk and everyone at SpaceX slash NASA to name it after my favorite creature dragons. I thought that was just so nice. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about. Space, earth, Mars, and a helicopter on Mars and feeling like you live in the future and actually seeing a flying car. Very cool. All of that. Really cool. Well, I mean, even at UCLA, the little robots that deliver food to the students like pizza. Students love pizza. But it's the cutest little robot. You know, what's it called? Space something? Flying saucer or something? I don't know. But it's really cute. It's really cute. And it says, have a nice day. <laughs> this is the future, man. I thought Roomba was pretty futuristic. But then I saw this little guy. Very cute. Cars that have wheels but can walk over terrain. I mean, you guys out there that are creating those, those cool things like that are, you know, you have my attention and I love you guys. Like I said before, it's cool to be you. It is so cool to be you.
It is so cool to be you. I mean, if only I were that smart, right? Oh, good thing I'm creative. Um, but anyway, uh, let's see. What else do we have? Uh, do you think U.S. will put a woman astronaut on the moon before tackling a manned mission to Mars? Yep. Are you seeing this? Yes. Absolutely. The moon landing is really, really uh, slated to be very, very soon, but it's close, right? So um, how cool is that? Yeah, that's in the works, guys. That's in the works. It's called uh, Artemis. Yeah, I think it's called Artemis. 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 I think it is. I have to look at my patch. I have that patch too. I'm telling you, when it comes to space, I get what in the film industry, when you really, really love something, they call you a squid because you suck on to stuff that you love and you just extract everything you can from it. I'm a baby squid, you know, baby squid, do, 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 baby squid, do, 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 do. That's me. I'm a baby squid. So I don't necessarily know everything like you super squids out there, or Marvelites, but I'm working on it. It's one of the things that I absolutely love. And everything stops when I want to watch NASA. Um, I watch the NASA channel uh, off. I have it in the background because it's the way I can see Earth from space. I don't know if I'll get to see Earth from space. I get motion sickness watching video games. So for me, hmm, is that going to happen? I don't know. But anyway, so I get squidly about this stuff. So yes. Do you have any memories of Mission to Mars attraction at Disneyland? What did you think of it? I liked it. But you know what I liked better than Mission to Mars at Disneyland was the rocket ship to the moon. I think I said this story the last time. When I was a little kid, uh, there was a big space, there was a spaceship in the middle of Disneyland with a with stairs that took you up. And then you climbed into the spaceship and you took a quick trip to the moon. And I love that as a little kid. Yeah, I could not get enough of that, including the little flying saucers that you sat in and manned and floated all over. Thank you, Bob Gurr. And I uh, just loved it. Just loved it. Vroom, vroom, vroom. You really felt like, oh, that was so awesome back in those days. And um, I got out and I kept saying to my dad, I keep, I, 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 I when do they go to the moon, daddy? And my dad says, well, they go. You just keep missing them take off. And so I tried to just stare at the ship so that I could see it take off from Disneyland. But, of course, it, it you know, a kid has this much, you know, the attention span of a gnat, and I'm no different. So, so, um, so I would turn away and start to walk, and my dad says, there it goes. And I'd look back, and he'd go, oh, it's back. You missed it. So it was so funny because I'd look at the ship, and then I'd turn away and my father would go, there it goes. And I'd spin around as fast as I could. And he'd go, oh, you missed it. And I'm like, how do they do that? And he'd go, speed of light, honey, speed of light. And as a kid, I bought into it, you know? <laughs> I have to tell you, my father's so creative. And he tells me that's not where I get it. But I do get it from my dad. My dad is amazing. And... um He's amazing. Just so, so, so wonderful. Uh, it's great to have him as a dad. It's cool to be me when I think of my dad. And uh, uh, I'm actually just opening this um, protein drink because I've had no breakfast today, so forgive me. There. <laughs> I don't want you to think I'm doing product placement. But I do like these little shakes. So thank you for allowing me to take a break and, and do that. Many of you have probably said, okay, I'm out of here. And that's fine. Okay. Uh, let's see. But Mission to Mars at Disneyland was very interesting. I just missed the spaceship. Because I loved seeing the spaceship. And Mission to Mars, of course, didn't have the spaceship. What it did have is Mission Control, which was is cool. I thought Mission Control was awesome. So you kind of make a trade, don't you? You trade back and forth uh, as to that and what's happening, right? That's what you do. Look, there's a glue bottle in here. That's from uh, my Hitchhiking Ghosts. I'm just going back here 
because I want to re-fire up my teapot so that I can have more warm, more hot water. I know we're probably pretty, pretty close to signing off, but I do want to go back and hear your comments. So, uh, so I will do that because right now we are at two hours right now, right now we're at two hours. Wow. <laughs> Not like last week. Okay. There were some Chuck Jones fans disappointed that Marvin the Martian wasn't there to greet. Oh, isn't that cute? Oh, my goodness. They missed that one, didn't they? Wouldn't that have been fun to maybe have somewhere on Perseverance a, a Martin the Martian somewhere? <laughs> that would have been that would have been very nice. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Didn't you create a piece of art for charity auction for his foundation? Yes, yes, indeed. So Chuck Jones has a red dot society for the center of creativity. Chuck Jones and Fritz and all of them. Let me see if I can find it. And uh, they invite artists. Oh, Siri is like, why do you want? Go away. Yeah, go away. Does anybody actually like Siri? I certainly don't. Um, anyway, uh, I should. So many things we could talk about, guys. It's just, it's, it's a plethora of things, you know. And I'm sure some of you stay on just because, you know, can she actually have more fresh stuff to talk about. Yeah, baby. Right now we're going to talk about Chuck Jones, the center of creativity and why it's something you should be involved in. Okay. Because Chuck Jones center of creativity has a red dot event, which should be coming up fairly shortly. I think it happens around May ish. I should actually reach out to them. So thank you, Leo, for reminding me. Oh, I love tea. Anyway. Um, they ask me, they ask artists to do donations and many of you paint this year. I'm going to ask them if I can submit a painting again, and I'm sure they'll say yes, because they're good people. But um, I'm trying to see if I have it here. I don't know if I have it here. If I do, I will show it to you because I'd love to show it to you. Uh, Chuck Jones Center. <laughs> Is it here, guys? Is it here? Could it be here somewhere? Don't see it. Bummer. Bummer. Anyway. Uh, I had been doing paintings. They send you a 12 inch by 12 inch uh, canvas and you paint whatever you want on it that has to do with Chuck Jones. You can also do uh, the other characters. Um, you can do... Pink Panther, you can do uh, all of those characters as well. Tweety Bird, Def, uh, you know. But you can also do Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck. I think the idea of the red dot is a person, people come to this event. They look at paintings done by all these artists. And if they like it, they put a red dot on it and they pay uh, an amount to charity for that red dot. It's been a while since I've been there. So it, it, at the time I was there, it was $750. But I don't know if that's the case now. But the red dot is what they help. And it's the center of creativity. And it's for young people. I found that I loved it so much because I, I am young at heart. So I learned some animation there. And... Honestly, I didn't get to uh, uh, necessarily participate in the class, but when you watch someone who's eight or seven or six doing animation and all of a sudden you realize, it, wow, if that child is amazing. And some of the children are pretty precocious, so you can actually ask those kids if they, there we go, yay, yay, T, yay, T. You can ask the children how they animate. And for 
and for and for me, everyone, here's the thing: a child can often be a better teacher for me. We're we're you know they're super smart, and I'm somewhere in kid level. So um, so honestly. Go. Honestly, this 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 is something that I found that young kids are, are, are you know, they they get me and, and I get them and and they, they teach me some great stuff. This is my ginger tea packet from my little Chinese market that I like to go to. Wing hop fun. I love it. I couldn't go last weekend because it was Chinese New Year and they said, stay away. <laughs> Not good to go because it was going to be a big group of people celebrating the Chinese New Year. So, of course, I didn't. So thank you for allowing me to make my tea. Uh, I am a major supercalifragilistic tea drinker. And so there I go. Anyway, uh, a kid, a child... Teaching me is always better. So when I went to visit the Center for Creativity and learned some animation, I was learning it from children and I was loving it. But this is what the Center for Creativity is. It's amazing. And one year they asked me for the anniversary of What's Up Doc? What's Up? What's Opera Doc? Forgive me. What's Opera Doc? That particular animated cartoon where Bugs Bunny is, you know, playing that cute little, you know, doing that opera and uh, has the braids and everything. I did a little sculpture of that, that character. And let me just see, maybe I have it in one of my albums. Cause if I do, I'd love to show it to you. Let me see if I can find it. Don't know if it's here, but if it is, no, it's not there. I thought it might be under commissions, but I, I do a lot of donated things to charity and, uh, well, a few more cosplay stuff. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can find it in my major presentation section, because if I can, I'd really love to show it to you. It is quite lovely. When you're an artist and you're an obsessive creator, you just want to keep making stuff. You keep making more and more and more stuff and you offer it to charity because you wanted them to be successful or you create small objects or you uh, do rose floats. I've done rose floats. If you're interested in knowing what rose float, I'm happy to share it with you. Commissioned work, uh, work for Guillermo del Toro. It's it's the the hit parade just keeps on coming, you know. And it's really, really fun. It's seriously uh, it's seriously wonderful. And I just can't seem to find this little stinker. He's, he's eluding me. And I know I have pictures in here, but I don't see him. He is hiding. Yeah, he is hiding from me. Actually, it's Bugs Bunny in that outfit. And I did it for the Center of Creativity. So... Um, I don't want you to sit and watch the side of my head while I'm trying to do it. So I will say next time, okay, I'll look it up, see if I can find it. And uh, one of the things I will do is take a peek here. Maybe I've got it in my, in my phone. Maybe it's in that set of pictures. Let's see. Really super quickly if it's in here. No harm, no foul. I guess I'm gonna have to do. You know when you have you you know you got a gazillion photos in your your album and you're like you're like hey man, <laughs> good luck finding it right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 you, you your whole body says you better download. Download, come on, download. By the way, you better because your phone is going. <laughs> so uh, if you're just joining me, I wanted to say that again. If you're joining me again, uh, I am looking for pictures from the Center of Creativity 
Uh, Chuck Jones, wonderful. This is something that I want to do. I want to have a place where people can go and create like Ryman Arts, that's Herbie Ryman and Chuck Chuck Jones Center for Creativity. Because honestly, guys, this would be a great way to give back, wouldn't it? I would love to have that. And that's going to take a little time. Um, I was working with Marty Scalar before he passed, and Marty was giving me advice on how I might do this. And uh, there's lots of people who say they will help me with such a thing, but it's going to take some real dedication. And right now, uh, there's so many other things I should be doing. Just forgive me. I'm going to go through here pretty fast so I can see if I can find it. No. I'm running across a beautiful, a beautiful and adorable Oswald the Lucky Rabbit and uh, Norway. And uh, I don't even know if it's in here. So I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, I'm guessing. But I'll try one more second to see if I can find it. And if I can't find, oh, wait. Well, here is, this isn't the sculpture I was going to show you. But I'll show you this one. This kind of gives you an idea. So you can do sculptures or you can do paintings. And I don't have the painting. But here I will show you this one. I got to make sure it will, it will pop up. There it is. Okay, so here you go. So this is a little sculpture done for the Center of Creativity's Red Dot Society event. And this is, of course, the one where poor little Daffy is being persecuted by Bugs Bunny. So thank you for joining me at this late hour. I've been going for over two hours, so feel free to watch the beginning. We talk Ghostbusters. We talk Cruella de Vil. We talk all kinds of things. Come in, warm yourself by the fire, and stay away from the harsh world of the reality, at least for now. Anyway, this little guy, that's not it, that's me. Okay, here he is. So here he is, it's a sculpture. And then I did this cute little illustration and then here he is all painted up. Now, this is of course the one where Bugs Bunny says, ain't I a stinker because he ends up being the animator on this. So there he is. It's a really sweet, cute paint job. He's about, uh, oh, I'd say he's about uh, yay big. So he's the same as about Groot. And he did well. He did quite well. I was very happy that people loved him. But that's that's the kind of thing you can do. You do things for charity. and then, But mostly, mostly the Center of Creativity hands you a 12 by 12 inch piece of uh, a canvas and you paint whatever you want on it. I will say one of the things that people seem to love to purchase are Bugs Bunny as uh, uh, a Star Wars character. Those always seem to do it. So he's a Jedi. So Bugs Bunny is a Jedi. Unusual and interesting uh, things where Bugs Bunny or Daffy Duck or the various characters are pulled out of their normal genre. There are people that buy the classic uh, reproductions of these characters, but it really is a fun show. Like I said, it usually happens, I want to say around March, April. And I don't know what's happening with the pandemic, but I, because you have said this, I will reach out to them and maybe I can give you some more information because the least I can do is to say, um, um, the least I can do is uh, reach out and see if they're going to have even a virtual one, right? So I'm just going to write that down. There we go. Yay for us, okay? Uh, okay. Since we're on the topic of art and space a few months ago, the U.S. Postal Service availed two new stamps. Yes, indeed, they did. They did, they did, they did. Star Wars stamps. Have you heard of these guys? Um, yeah, and Leo sent me these too. Now, I actually had these. But I got not not the stamps, but the photos of them. But I really appreciate Leo doing this because um, I hadn't printed out the photos of them. But here is what the sheet looks like. Now, rumor has it, these Star Wars stamps are going to release, be released in May. Is anybody listening to May the 4th, maybe? 
be with you. <laughs> but here they are. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I am a cachet artist, meaning that I do first day covers. And a first day cover is uh, uh, a stamp collector who collects the, the stamp on an envelope or postcard first day of issue. Now, what a cachet artist does, and you can do this too if you're an artist, if you're interested, um, what a cachet artist does is they do an illustration next to the uh, cancellation in the first day of issue on the first day of issue envelope. And I'll get to that in a bit later. Let's keep showing you the coolness of these characters. Aren't these droids amazing? So it is the U.S. Postal Service salute to droids. And here you go. And they should be released sometime in May. And then here's some close-ups of them. Aren't they awesome? I love this one. This one is so cute. Look at his fun feet. They're all just great. They're all just great. Some of them look like armatures to me. And then our famous guy, of course, our famous love right here. And then this one is awful cute too, right? And then we fell in love with this one just recently, didn't we? Wasn't he a little cutie pie? And then various others. And C-3PO, of course. Yay! This is what I wanted to do originally when I was when I created my Wookiee, is I originally wanted to do C-3PO, but I couldn't figure out how to build him. So, and then of course the adorable, you could not have a series of droid stamps without BB-8. And then there's Mars. So uh, aren't those cute? Aren't those adorable? Yeah. So they have not yet, as of today, I don't think they have. Let me just check one thing for you guys. I promised I would check this and see, but I do not think they have released the, uh, let's see. There's some updated cancellation samples she did as of January, but today she just sent some new things. But no, 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 not yet. Not yet. But I will keep you guys posted, okay? Uh, because I'm a cachet artist and because I'm a member of a great uh, club that does first day covers, they... Uh, have got me connected with the release times for um, the release times for uh, uh, oh dear nail in the coffin of Woody Allen oh dear I don't know what that is sorry I didn't mean to look at that I didn't mean to look at that I did not look at that I did not look at that <laughs> I'm sorry Anyway, they give certain release dates of certain stamps, okay? And then they tell you what the day is, and then they tell you they pick a post office. So for Bugs Bunny last year, they they used uh, Warner Brothers Hollywood for the area, general area, where that post office was granted a special date or stamp that shows that you are actually at the post office that launches the stamp. All post offices have that stamp on the first day of issue. But Star Wars has not yet told us when the first day of issue is. But I will keep you guys posted, okay? Because we all want to know, and they will sell out fast. I won't even lie. So you want to make sure you get yours. And um, first day of issue. So let me show you. I really should go into favorites, but here, let me just boop. Forgive me as I skate around here trying to find what I'm looking for. These aren't the droids you're looking for. No, not them either. These aren't the droids you're looking for. <laughs> okay, we're close. At least I thought we were close. If I can't find them here, I know where else to find them. So, all right, enough of that. We're going to go up here. This is easier because I have it in a album called Favorites. And that makes my life a lot easier when I go into an album called Favorites. All right, here we go. Okay, so 
here are my um, some of my caches so that you can see them. There you go. So this stamp was released, uh, when was it released? Year before last. And uh, it is known as the transcontinental celebrating of the two trains coming together. And I did an illustration of Walton Ward and these are available for sale. They're $40 for the set. And they have easily, um, they easily have uh, $10 worth of stamps on each one. You cannot fake a stamp, okay? That is against the law. You have to use the actual stamps on the envelope. And then the markings you see here are actually the cancellations for the first day of issue. You see how it says on one side, first day and the date, 2019, May. That was the first day of issue. And on one side, it celebrates the golden spike. And on the other side, it celebrates. And so I did the illustration of Walt Disney and Ward Kimball, and it took first place in 2020 in the cachet contest. Yay! So, um, so these are available. You go to my website, terryharden.com, click on online store, and you'll find them there. They make a great gift. They're beautiful. They're limited. They're pretty gorgeous. And uh, they're reasonable. You know, you figure there's about $10 worth of stamps and they're $40 for the set. So what am I really making on them is exactly my point. Um, you know, but it's it's fun. You guys will enjoy them. And this is what stamp collectors, mini stamp collectors do is they create, they get these first day of issues stamped on an envelope or a thing. And then a cachet is something that is in the field where they are not. Or uh, in the case that you saw, they could be on top of uh, the issue. So the first set I did was this set. And I let me just uh, make that turn around a little bit. There we go. That's better. That's better, better. There we go. So this set right here is the very first group that I did. These are the Dragon Stamps. So in 2018, I was introduced by Michael Luzzi and a team of stamp, very excited stamp collectors who taught me about the first day covers. These are hand-drawn and hand-painted. So I get confused by this, but I will try to explain cachets to you. And a cachet is the illustration the bit of information, uh, in some cases, they stick an object there. It's anything that's in that field where my dragon is. In this case, these, these hand-drawn, hand-painted dragons are the most complicated and the most expensive to do. These are a set of eight envelopes because there are eight stamps. Now, you noticed that Star Wars had 10. So if I was going to hand draw and hand illustrate sets for people to collect, it would be the same, pardon my French, nightmare that I had with this. Here is 128 individual hand-drawn, hand-painted envelopes. They took best of show. No hand-drawn, hand-illustrating artist will do this many envelopes because it is really stupid. <laughs> but it was my first time and I didn't know. So I did it, but this set, and I have a couple left, sells for uh, $670 for the set because they took the show. They won best of show, they won best hand-drawn, hand-painted, and best new artist. And I, the, the artists are no slouch in these contests. They are super califragilistic, amazing artists. So the fact that I won this was, was really an honor and uh, like I said, these are still available. So the idea is to celebrate the stamp. You see with the king here, I call this one the king. You see the little golden Chinese dragon and his little pagoda. Well, I did my version, my illustration um, there. The goal is stamp collectors will tell you is that if the cancellation, that's the part that says first day of issue dragons, if the cancellation is in black and white, you color your character. Now, if we swing over here, we'll use the king as the same example. If the 
cancellation is in color, you do it in black and white. And I did it in black and white with some touches of color. But then I also pulled from the stamp elements I thought would best depict the on the envelope. And over here, you can see that there's the little pagoda all the way over to the left and a little hill there. And if we go back over to the color one, you can see this a little better. There's the little pagoda and the green hills. And then we come up over to the stamp and there's the pagoda and the green hills. You can even see those funky little trees there. I did the funky little trees. And uh, you got to make them as close to each other. But I did 16 sets of eight and I maybe have two or three left. And and the nice thing about something like this is if somebody doesn't buy the set for $650, they just keep appreciating like gold coins. So um, especially since they won, they took the contest. So um, they're very beautiful. I've done several others. Uh, I've done several others. And uh, uh, some sell and some do not. But I'm learning because, you know, I'm... Uh, I'm brand new at all of this. So uh, here's my Halloween version ones that I did. I thought they were really cute. Um, these are available at my store. So go to terryharden.com and look at on uh, un, online store and it'll take you and show you a bunch of cool stuff. But here they are. These are spooky silhouettes. Again, a color one. These uh, have uh, foil. So they uh, sort of, you know, do that ver verdigree kind of pretty thing back and forth. And then these are based on, uh, these are dinosaur ones. These are lenticular dinosaur ones. And these dinosaur ones are based on Realm of the Dinosaurs. And then I did a little thing on Silly Symphonies. So you can kind of see that's what they are. So if we go back to, oh, we are there. If we go all the way back to these Star Wars stamps, that's the next thing that I've got to do is I've got to uh, consider, oops, consider, I've got to consider uh, what I'm going to do to celebrate these stamps. But as I said, there's 10 different ones. So if I were to do like the eight different dragons, I would be insane. So that's not going to happen. But what I am going to do, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to be... 110% with you, but I need to do something Star Wars because I'm the Star Wars queen. Now, if I was super smart, I'm looking to release my book on uh, May the 4th. And for a bonus for pre-sellers, maybe I'll just include a sheet of stamps, you know. But if they're being released on that same day, you know, it's all going to be about timing, right? Right. So there you have it. Let's go back to your, um, oh, here we go. We're going, what do I think of the designs? I think the designs are great. And my favorite robot is C-3PO. Yeah, and I also like the one that gets kicked by the stormtroopers because the stormtroopers couldn't see, so they kept kicking that little dude. Yeah, I feel, always feel for him. Uh, but anyway, first day covers, price point, not an option right now because I have to figure out what I'm going to do. Am I going to print? Am I going to illustrate? Am I going to hand draw? That's all stuff that happens with the cachets and you got to figure it out. So now we're going to go back to your comments and uh, let's see what we've got. Yeah, that was Leo's last. I sent you plenty of questions. Well, now, Leo, I've answered plenty of questions. Thank you, Catherine, for saying that you're enjoying yourself. You may not still be here, but I'm going to thank you anyway, in case you come back and visit later. And for those of you who are actually sitting through this uh, and I'm not live, please consider subscribing. This long version of what I'm doing, the comfy chat, sitting by the star, the side of the fire, is really for the pandemic. Many have asked if I would go for two to three hours simply because it it kind of kicks off your weekend. So that's why they go so long. But I'm working on short versions so that you can find the question that you asked and answered if you don't have an afternoon to spend with me or most of the morning. 
So that's what's happening right now. It will change. Okay. Uh, are you working on a, a biographical book with photo pages? If not, be wonderful. Um, to, I had no idea what a legend. Holy cow. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I have a book called Tales from Terry, A Disney Sculptor's Life, I think is the name of it. <laughs> it's uh, you can get it in an ebook, but but don't don't you know, if you want to get it in an ebook, please do. Most of it's sold out, except if you're near Walt's Barn, they might have a few copies left. Last time I was there, they had a few copies, a handful of copies. And you can buy the hardcover, but. The only reason you want that hardcover is because that's the preliminary book I did based on my life. It's a volume one. And it was basically done to see if you guys would read it and even care because, you know, I never thought I was much of a writer, Sharon. And so, uh, but when I wrote it, they said it sounded just like me, but they had, all of you had changes. First of all, you like to collect hardbacks. So my new one is a hardback. And second of all, you didn't like the cover. So I'm redoing the cover. And third of all, it's going to be in a box set of three. That's not happening this year. Let me say that again. Beep, 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 beep. That's not going to happen this year. Um, this year, excuse me, heavens, Terry, must be that shake. Must be that shake. Um, this year, I'm going to do my Star Wars book. In honor of Star Wars, in honor of Mandalorian, in honor of loving Star Wars as much as I do, and, and my history with the film and how it's brought me all my joys, my trials, my tribulations, my opportunity to get and actually sit with George Lucas. I'm listed in George Lucas's book, Skywalking. Um, I'm on page three for seeing the movie Star Wars, the original, 181 times. And I will talk about that story, tell you what's going. There will be pictures, as many as I can include. I don't know if I have the ones where I, I don't really, I don't think I thought to take a picture of myself when I was sneaking into the theater, but I will tell you about it and maybe I'll sketch it so you can see that. That might be a good idea. Let me write sketch that. That would be good. Where are those questions? I'm going to say Star Wars book. Sketch what's not there. But there'll be sketches and uh, photos and anything I can find. But there's a lot going on. And, and there's one more thing I've got to do, and I'm doing it today. And then I'm working on my ghosts because uh, you guys who are slated for hitchhiking ghosts in February, you're going to get them in February. Next week, they go out. You will get a tracking number if you are the February group. And the February group is five people. And uh, then the March group. Then the April group, May, June, July, 10 months. Uh, that's how it's working. Uh, may not exactly be 10 months because I've got 13 sets left. And uh, 13 sets of these amazing ghosts. And if you haven't seen them, here they are for your viewing pleasure, the Hitchhiking Ghosts. Hello, Shelby. So these are the Illuminating Ghosts. They are not inexpensive. They are $12.99, $1,299 for them because they actually do light up. So they're pricey. Okay, but they are an investment. You get three. These are the black light ghosts. Now, these are a little more affordable at $750 for the set, and they are being sold now. Again, go to my website and click on online store. It's not going to cuff you. You're welcome to peruse the store and buy if you want. They are all pre-sold. So I will show you. Here they are. Here's some more of these great shots that my husband took. They really are eerie, fun, fabulous. They are limited. The illuminated ghosts are limited to, uh, I'm just going to run through. Here's, here's the black light ghost. You can see what happens when you hit him with a black light. I might even, and there he is, all black light right there for you. Woo-hoo, woo-hoo, woo-hoo. Um, 
I'll even do a little film for you that will show you. Um, I'll show you exactly what they look like. Um, here they are on your shelf, the ghosts. But the illuminating ghost became really difficult for me to make. There's only 50 sets available and I only have 50, 13 sets left. So hit me in the comments, talk to me on, uh, you know, uh, Messenger or whatever, if you're interested. There are payment plans. So if you fall in love with these guys, but aren't they pretty, they illuminate, meaning that they aren't a light bulb that just goes on. They're made to duplicate little specters. And if we look here, they're also separate. So with the lights out, there they are on your shelf, illuminating. Don't they look like they're floating? Very proud of them. And then... Uh, the next one is this one, which shows the black light version. So they are my original sculptures. Still, they're just different treatments. This one has the external black light. The other has the internal illuminating light. So there you go. There's the ghosts. The illuminating ones are only being released five per month because they are so involved. You wouldn't even imagine the work. First two years to work on these guys. Two years to get these. Two years ago, Joshua Schaefer suggested them. And then we tried to build them and we couldn't. We just, I just, I just couldn't figure it out. One of the problems was to get batteries small enough in the base that would work. And finally, when we started them um, during the pandemic, we found out that AAA batteries now fit in the base. And uh, we could offer them to you because we wanted them to be easy. We wanted them to be simple. And those little disc batteries that you get, you know, in those little remotes and stuff, they're kind of a pain. I didn't want you guys to have to worry about that. You open them up and they slide in this little clip or whatever, and it's a nightmare. So this, you just do it like you would any AAA battery. You you flip them over, put something soft below. Um, and I have a diagram inside each box of the ghost to tell you how to put batteries in if you bought these illuminating ghosts. But I don't know when I'm going to do another. This is the first illuminating thing I've done, and I don't know if I'm going to do another one. It was so challenging, but I was determined to get it done. And so if you are fortunate enough to own one of these 50, congratulations, because they are going to appreciate because I'm not planning on doing any more. Oh, Lord have mercy. What a workout. What a workout. The sculptures are stunning. I always do sculptures that don't look like everyone else's because I feel guys like you need to be able to look on the shelf and know which ones are from me. And this isn't ego talking when it comes to these, these ghost sculptures. It's because you've bought so many ghosts that look all the same that I just don't want you to have a shelf full of them all doing this. You know, I want them to do it, but I want them to do it in such a way that is interesting and intriguing, but yet unique to my they're called impressions. So unique to the impressions that I have. So if I take you through my journey, if I may, to creating a sculpture, I did this a little bit last time, but let's just treat you to a little bit more. This was my first idea for Ezra and he's done in a Chavant clay. It's an oil-based clay, but you notice he's kind of blobby right here. And the reason is because I'm just with my fingers working to try and find what pose is good. And then if I feel frustrated, I walk away and I come back. Well, this is the case of Dear Ezra here. And then I decided that I thought what looked better, and I did talk to my patrons about this, uh, is that I would make, I would take some license and make Ezra just a little different. So I learn about the characters that I'm sculpting. And then I think about as their personalities, what would they be doing as the personality? And I think Ezra is the cocky one of the group, wouldn't you say? He's the leader. He's the stinker. I know he gave me a lot of trouble when I was working with him. And he still tries to because he is the one in charge. But Ezra here, here's the rough of Ezra. And I just loved his stance. He is still doing his hitchhiking thumb, as you can see. And he's tipping his hat. But he's very, you get, when you look at Ezra, you get the feeling he is so proud of being the bee's knees of the hitchhiking ghost. Don't you think so? 
Don't you think that's kind of, you know, he's the leader. He's very proud of being the leader. Anyway, this is my vision when I see it. And then here he is done. So this is Ezra. I've cleaned up the clay and here he is very happy. He's got his little slippers. I actually talked to a lot of you about slippers or a different kind of shoe. And everybody said the Disneyland one has slippers. So we gave him the little bedroom slippers, which cracked me up because I was like, it doesn't really look like he's wearing a robe. But I've often worn my coat with my bedroom slippers to go out front to let my dog go potty. So I guess this is something that is, is very, very true. So at the two hour, 39 and 26 seconds, we're talking about the hitchhiking ghosts and what it took to make them two years in the making and then another several months. And now they're finally being delivered to all of you. I have 13 sets left of the illuminating ones. And then the black light ghosts are limited to a hundred. And I've only said, I've only sold about 10 sets of those. So there's plenty of the black light ghosts. If I was in front of you in person, you could hold these and touch these because this is what I like to do. But since we can't, this is where it is. And, and I've got uh, Shelby's hello, just because I, I like Shelby's hello. So, uh, and then Bonnie says, haven't been able to join the Zoom calls due to work time, but eventually will. Bonnie, how do you feel about 11 o'clock? They're thinking about pushing it back to 11 o'clock on Zoom. And that is the uh, Patreon page. Anyway, back to Ezra. Ezra here, as you can see, he's very detailed in the clay. He's only about, well, let me show you. Hide on Ezra. We'll, we'll just cut to a little Ezra here, a little Ezra action. You can see how big Ezra actually is. And you see that Ezra has a bit of a lean. Well, here's Ezra. See how big he is? And see how he has that little bit of a lean? Isn't he cute? And then I don't know. He doesn't illuminate because I took the batteries out. So I apologize for that, that you can't see him actually. But there's a switch on the back and you, you hit it and there it is. Yeah. Isn't he sweet? And he's, he's, see, he's just, he's good size. Yeah. Yeah. That's him. And they come in a set of three. Yes, they do. And, uh, here he is again, sculpted, uh, in the clay that I like to use. And that eyeball, in case you're wondering, is a bead. So I often use little beads when I want little round balls for the eyes and, uh, I did a bead in this one. I thought this would be fun. I could have done it in the other one, but I really, really liked the way just one bead sort of went boink, boink. <laughs> now you can see in the sculpted one here that there's no, there's no boink eyeball. You know, it's kind of the same. Yeah. I mean, you can't see it there, but I'll, I'll show you a picture of him and you can see the difference. But anyway, so if we go back to this one, so there's Ezra and then, we move, we move over to little Gus. Now, Gus is a very sweet, he is our quiet one of the group. Although he is a prankster like everyone else, little Gus is one of these guys that doesn't say much. He's just a sweet, happy spirit that sometimes plays and sometimes is more pensive. And this is the way I feel about little Gus. One of the things I wanted to do for Gus is if you look, if you are a hitchhiking ghost collector, take a look at the ball and chain that your uh, Gus's have. I decided it was time to let Gus put the ball down. He's often holding the ball and I know that ball is heavy and for centuries having to carry it around must have been a drag for little Gus. So I wanted to give little Gus a break and he gets to put the ball down. Again, I use a bead for the ball and I used actual chain for the chain. And then when it's casted up, it's all the same. And uh, it's just, it's just lovely. He's a sweet little guy. Here he is sideways. It's very important for my pieces to have some kind of motion. I want them to feel like they are in movement. So you see how his hair kind of swishes and his little body is off to the side and he has a cute little bottom and he's got that little scrunchy little toes. See his little toes there? Yeah, so he really is a special little. He, he really is cute. He really is cute. Um, let me go back a moment. 
And I'm wondering if I have Professor Phineas. Professor Phineas may have eluded me as far as his sculpture. Poor Professor Phineas. That's no fair. So let me go to my desk. I know I have Professor Phineas over here. Here is dear Professor Phineas. And he's being blocked by a glue bottle. And you're like, why is he blocked by a glue bottle? And I'm like, I don't know. So I'm going to turn on a light here. And it kind of shows you as we take this off. The dear Professor Phineas. So you can't see him super close here. But this is the clay. And what's really nice, guys, is that the clay managed to be preserved thank you to uh my mold people that did that but we'll go to this cut right here and you can see professor phineas just a little bit better there we go there's the prof see him so he is the shuckster he's the one that's going to sell you some snake oil or a deed to a house that doesn't exist so he's the smart one of the group. And you can see here how he stands leaning forward, how he's got this lean. Notice how the coat has flow and his bag. Yeah, and I'm going to show you them lit up again and show you, point out a couple of things that are really great about the professor here. Yeah, he's pretty sweet. If we go to the above angle in front of the... We might be able to see him just a touch better. There he is. That light really wanted to come in. But there he is. There's the prof. See? Isn't he cute? And I'm really lucky because the, uh, the um, clays survived, and they don't always survive. Sometimes they the clays are sacrificed. So it was great to have the clays, and then the my mold maker put them in these little cases for me. So I have them here. I don't usually sell the clays, um, but there are some people that own the clays of my work. There's two people, Tony Baxter and Tony Baxter owns my Maleficent in all versions and a wonderful woman named Liz Bradley who helped me with Tinkerbell's map. She has all versions. So if I take you back to uh, what we were speaking of earlier. Um, here are the ghosts lit. So you see they illuminate. They don't necessarily, light doesn't necessarily go on and off with them because I wanted the feeling of a floating specter on your shelf. Many of you who I was in conference with for quite a long time on these ghosts, said you wanted to be able to separate them, tuck them in the various places on your shelf because they are playful and silly like at the Haunted Mansion. And apparently in Florida, isn't it true that they are bouncing and actually moving? That's a new um, addition from Disney. So it was nice to kind of have these to celebrate that. But if we zoom in here, you notice, let me just pull that up. You see how in Professor Phineas, how you can see his leg through the bag isn't this the way it happens with specters? You can kind of see some areas that are dark, some are light, because it has that undulating feel like this. This was not easy for me to grab. This was not easy for me to do, but I wasn't about to give up. This was so important to me. The challenge was COVID-19. COVID-19 made it a little difficult for me they became more expensive than I wanted them to be, and they can only be produced five per month because they're that involved. Let me show you Gus. Here's Gus. You remember, Gus had the little ball and chain. Isn't that pretty? So now we have the ball with a little bit of translucence here and the chain. Isn't that great? So these are a really lovely addition for you to have on your shelf if you're someone that um, 
If you're someone that loves the ghosts and wants something a little neat, unique and unusual. Many collectors have said to me they're collecting original art. They've said they want to collect original they they want to collect art not not trinkets. Okay? They have magic bands, they have buttons, they have pins and, and pins nothing against any of this stuff guys. It's just that many people during COVID-19 said they'd like to invest in some real art. These ghosts are real art. So if they appeal to you, you want them to do a payment plan or whatever, just talk to me. I've got a few in process. But they are uh, they are an investment. They, the illuminated ones are not. Well, both of them are investment because the black light ones are 750 plus tax and shipping. And the um, it's a flat rate for shipping. I ship them priority. And the illuminating ghosts are... 1200 1299 something like that 1299 something like that anyway um i may have only said no anyway yeah 1299 and uh and uh that's because uh manufacturer upped me by $300 so uh but there's 13 left out of 50 i i was going to do 100 sets i dropped it to 50 to make them more valuable should at some point you want to resell them they will appreciate they really will because they're just so amazing they really are amazing i wish you could have them in your hands beforehand and um I'm going to grab the professor really quick and Ezra, I'm going to just kind of grab them so that they stay safe. Oh. Okay. So I was going to show you that they do just turn on. So <laughs> the little button, this is my art proof. So now you can see how it works. Fun, huh? Yeah. Woo! Anyway, there they are. There they are. I'm very, very proud of them. I'm really proud of them, guys. I mean, I really am. It, it was. It's hard work. It's. It continues to be difficult because I don't just throw them in a bag and send them to you in an envelope. You know, the, the whole experience, if you, uh, Joshua Schaefer, who's the one who suggested them, uh, if you've seen his presentation on Facebook, you see what, uh, he does, he actually does an unboxing and, um, and, uh, when you see what, what I've gone through to make them so special for you from the time you pull them out of your priority mailbox till the time you get to the ghosts and put the batteries in and do it, uh, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. So, it's not a sales pitch, but it's just to show you that there's when an artist does something like this, whether it be a painting or a sculpture or whatever, uh, there's so much that goes involved that gets involved. You do a little sketch to try and get an idea of how you want that interpretation to be. And from there, um, you meet with people, you talk about where your challenges are going to be. You talk about the poses. Are the poses too intricate, too difficult for the mold maker? Because anything that's too intricate, and many of my stuff is intricate, uh, it can cost a lot of money to have it made. And then I've got to see. So I've done other pieces like Jiminy Cricket and Groot. And this last year, I did Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, who sold out in New York Minute. I don't have any Oswalds left. I do have a wonderful Oswald pin that I showed you before. And uh, here it is. You can buy that at my store. It's $20. It's super cute. They're limited to, how many are limited to? Limited to 100 and I've signed it. We'll sign it again on the back for you. But it's uh, $3 shipping and uh, $20 for him at my store. TerryHarden.com and look at the online store. If that, that, if you like it and he's big, look how cute he is. He's really cute. So, you know, that's the point that I'm trying to bring home is that um, every time you create something, you want to create something that has an experience attached to it. In the case of the pins, it is a little bit of an experience too, but it's not boxed because I know a lot of you, a lot of the, the money goes into the pin. So, um, and then they embossed my name on the back, which I really love. And then I signed it underneath. 
So, uh, but you can go to the store. There's all kinds of pins that I have there and you can just decide if there's something you like, make some great gifts. If you've got a pin collector who wants something unusual, new and different. And then if it, if, if you buy it from my store, I actually sign them on the back with a permanent um, Sharpie type marker, right? So that's the experience for the pins. And then the experience for the ghosts go from the time you open the, the box to to what that box looked like. Uh, if, and some people have gotten them in January and have shared on Facebook. Maybe also, I don't know if they've shared on YouTube. I'm refraining from sharing now because uh, the February group, I want them to be, they may not have seen it and um, I want them to be surprised. But five takes five a month to get them. So you're going to prepay for them and then you're going to wait a little bit. But, uh, but I do have uh, 13 left. Isn't that funny that that number 13 is there, <laughs> you know? So, so yeah. So thank you for that question. I appreciate that. Um, okay. Yes, we did get that from Bonnie. Heck, you never have a problem filling up airtime, but costume examples were interesting. Thank you, Leo. No, I never do. And uh, that's why, Leo, you're allowed to take a vacation once in a while, okay? Uh, I didn't mention that for me, uh, taking Monday off, you know what I did over that weekend last weekend? I slept for three days. So obviously, like I said before, the world was on my shoulders a lot more than I thought about, too. And yesterday, I went and watched a Patreon webinar and the number one thing they said, if you're going to post on social media, media is to be sure to take some time off and make sure that your mental health is, is solid. So uh, it is solid when I talk to you guys now, but there was that ghost, blah, blah, blah. There was a lot of reality in my life that I thought I was handling well until last weekend when I collapsed. So just food for thought, guys, you know. I read and loved Dune books, but was so disappointed by the movie. Yes, Sharon, me too. Uh, though I haven't been meaning to watch it again, just in case. Oh my God, you were in Dune, mind blown. <laughs> and I also built the suits and I also have the patterns. There's one guy on Instagram who is so, I got to tell you, I met him in Canada in 2019. And he wants to know if I will sell a copy of the Dune suit patterns because he'd like to do it, build them or his girlfriend would. I can't remember at this point which one. And I kept telling him I got to find him first. I think I found them. And then I've got to decide, you know, what what would you spend for a copy of the Dune patterns? You, you know, not only do I have to send you the Dune patterns, but I have to send you how to put them on. <laughs> It's not so easy. It's not, you know, um, zip done. <laughs> but thank you for that. Yeah, the movie was a disappointment for me too, but there's a lot of elements that were really cool. The sandworm sequences was by far one of the most impressive scenes I've seen. Many wonderful actors in this. Really, really wonderful actors. And um, there's some great memories with Dune. I got to work and meet with Devin, David Lynch, and I found that wonderful. Bob Ringwood, who designed the costumes, that was a dream come true because he also did Excalibur. And I loved Excalibur. Um, so, you know, you can always find, you know, when you have those challenges, you can always find something that's extra special. Okay, we're at are we at two hours and 57 minutes already, guys? Lord have mercy. Bernstein bear is somehow related to the country bear's furry cousins. Maybe. I never thought of that and no one's ever told me, but maybe. Maybe they are. They are cute, aren't they? Thanks for the stay poke. Very fun. I'm so glad you liked it. I'm really glad you liked it. Uh, Larry says, do you have any involvement with the creation of Slimer the ghost? I didn't have any involvement with creating Slimer, but my friend Mark Wilson was Slimer in the first one. And, uh, Steve Johnson was the sculptor. You guys, you guys probably know XFX Steve Johnson. He's no longer XFX, but he's written a huge coffee table book. And now he looks like John Stark. I call I say he's channeling his inner Stark. <laughs> He really does. He's got the gray and everything. I mean, it's 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 really uh, uh, quite interesting. But uh, uh, I didn't have much to do with him, but I sure enjoyed Mark 
Mark Wilson and I go way back to the days of Magic Mountain when I was, you know, 17 years old. But uh, really, uh, and he, like I said, he plays Slimer in the, the first one. So um, what a great character. I will tell you, though, that I was working for a little shop called Shafton's and I made a Slimer for Universal Studios where someone could get in a walk around character and they did a Slimer and the tongue could come out and lick and the hands could go, oh my. And the person inside could shift between being a tongue and an arm to two arms to work the eyes. And it was a rolling Slimer. It was adorable. And I designed the whole thing from the ground up. Yeah, with uh, with a team of people over at Shafton. So I was quite proud of that. Shelby says, hi, Terry, wondering what it was like to work on Indian in the Covered. A dream. Do you guys know Frank Oz, Fozzie Bear, Muppets World? Okay, so Frank Oz comes down to the set. And I'm just blown. I'm so excited to see this guy. I love Frank Oz. Love, love, love Frank Oz. I got to actually work with him to program the penguins in Muppet 3D Theater. We were at a different Disney building and we were actually doing the programming for the penguin band that pops up during that. The only place you can see this right now is in Florida, right guys? And we programmed, I, me and my dear friend Bruce Lenoyle and Frank Oz and a few others programmed the penguins, the penguin band. <laughs> And then we did live performances of Bean Bunny, of Statler and Waldorf, of Sweetums. And we took turns doing those various characters. I never played Statler or Waldorf, but I did Bean Bunny and I did the Penguins and I did uh, Sweetums, which was one of the most fun things ever. I loved being Sweetums. It was so much fun. But anyway, um, Frank was there. Unfortunately, it was shortly after we lost Jim Henson, which was really a little bit melancholy. But... Uh, then we did Dinosaurs shortly after that, and Frank came on the set and was watching all of us, and it was so great to stand and talk with him afterwards. But uh, then um, during the hiatus of Dinosaurs between a couple of seasons, I got a phone call from Sony Pictures in um, downtown LA, and they wanted me to come and meet with Frank Oz. And I'm like, what? Are you punking me? Don't you ever think that when somebody calls you up and they go, they name a name and you're like, what is this about? But anyway, I went down there and I went to a small office that Frank had and Frank came out and said, Terry, I want you to do Indian in the cupboard. And I was going to play the Indian. I was actually going to be the puppeteer for the Indian. And I went home and studied the script and saw the puppets and everything. And, um, and, uh, we did the first scene, couple scenes, whatever, and uh, they decided to do the actual actor as an Indian and use computer generated. So the only uh, puppets that remain in Indian in the cupboard are the rat that attacks at the end and me. And it's the scene where the boy first discovers the Indian. The Indian is standing there and he says, wait a minute. He grabs the key, he opens the cupboard, he puts a teepee inside the cupboard. He locks it and it becomes a real teepee. You remember that scene? Well, I make the Indian turn to look. He's only about this big. In fact, just give me a minute and I'll show you what he looks like because I know exactly where he is. I'm pretty sure I know where he is. Oh, yes. Here he is. All right, guys, Indian in the cupboard. Thank you for asking this question. So uh, they gave this to me as a, as just as a, you know, me being a sculptor. So they said, hey, let's give this to you. And they did. So here is the big Indian from Indian in the cupboard. This is a um, resin casting of the Indian. So here he is. And then here is the smaller version of the Indian. So my job as the puppeteer was to, let's do camera three, here it is. So my job, let me just pull back here a little bit, with this Indian was to make him turn and look as the boy put the tent in there. So he did this, that's it, turn. And I was in the Chester drawer. We'll do that again for you, turn. <laughs> 
And we'll do it up here. Turn. <laughs> Big roll for me, right? Um, but anyway, yeah, it's great to have these. So cool. So cool. Thank you so much, Shelby, for asking me about it. But I did that and then also uh, some of the sequences with the rat when uh, they had the battle under the floor. But that's all the stuff I had. But I was originally hired for the entire film. Frank gave it to me because he thought I had no ego. And I was like, uh, yes, I do. But I was still happy to take take the job. I, I really don't argue with someone <laughs> when they offer me a job like that. And uh, once it went to CG... I ended up only doing the scenes at the beginning and the scenes at the end, but I get residuals from it because my scene was not cut. If they cut your scene, then you won't get paid residuals for the movie because you're not in the movie anymore. But that scene where he turns and looks at the tent when the boy puts it in the cupboard is indeed still me inside the cupboard. Frank's direction to me was he put me inside the cupboard and he said, when I knock, and say, are you okay? The only response I want to hear from you, Terry, is <laughs> like you're in agony. Aah! Aah! Okay, let's go. Because as director, he wanted to get people moving fast. So he'd go, Terry, are you all right? And I'd go, Aah! and he'd go, okay, puppet deer dying, let's go. And that's how he got people to move. And I was literally makita Makita being a drill, for those of you who may not know your drills, but uh, hand-drilled inside the cupboard against the wall because if I moved to perform and it moved, then that doesn't work. In many situations like dinosaurs, I did a thing called La uh, uh, Lassie, Nikki's family, and it involved Lassie, you know, Lassie, the dog Lassie. That's another story, but I was in the bed and then my friend Bruce, Bruce Lenoyle was in Chester drawers and they forgot to pull him out one time. That happens to us all the time. When you make a puppet look so real, people believe it. And so then they don't think that there's a puppeteer underneath that might not be able to get out to go to lunch. <laughs> so anyway, so that is, and that's why I left you up here, Shelby. That was a little bit of Indian in the cupboard, but it was really lovely. In fact, when I heard that they were giving residuals for Indian in the cupboard, I had to go before the Screen Actors Guild and prove my case. I had to actually uh, stop down the movie, show them the sequence and say, that's me. And, uh, and they ruled in my favor. At the time, I thought, what could it be? You know, a hundred bucks. It ended up being a heck of a lot more. So it was really good that I did that. Uh, but yes, that's how things go with films. Sometimes they, you look so real, you know. Why were names left out of the credits? That's Ghostbusters. Here's the deal with that. So Ghostbusters is my big film, my very first big films. I'm so proud. We go downtown and we're all at a special screening. And after the screening, I want to congratulate everyone. And no one seems to want to talk to me. And you know how you are when people don't talk to you, you kind of think, what is, it, what is it that I've done? And all of a sudden you say, what did I do in Ghostbusters that made all these people not like me? Well, that wasn't the case. It turns out that Richard Edlin, who had done Brainstorm and done many movies you know and love, he's brilliant. Um, what happened was he had negotiated with producers to put everybody's name in the credits. But the producers found a loophole and they left us off the credits, which was a heartbreaker because we really did work hard. You saw that article. That's a variety article that Richard Edlin took out because here's what happened. We had a party later because I I'm at the screening and no one will talk to each other. They won't talk to me. They won't talk to I'm thinking, what did I, is this the way it is on a movie set? You're all friends and then you're all enemies afterwards. Nobody wants to know you. I didn't know it was my first real strong film. Ghostbusters. Good first film, huh? Anyway, on Ghostbusters, what happened was that there was a party on the beach. And I went down with my husband at the time, Harrison Ray, and we went down to the party and we noticed that Richard Ellen was alone at the bar. You know, and the party, you know, there's food, there's dancing, there's happiness, and there's a bar. 
So we walked up to Richard Edlin and, and I asked him, I said, you know, I was very surprised at the way people were behaving at the premiere and I don't understand it. It's my first film. Is this the way it always works? And Richard said, no. He said everybody was angry because their name was left out of the credits. Now, I kind of assumed mine was left out because I was so new. But in reality, production had found a loophole and Richard Edlin said, I'm, a, I'm taking out a full page in Variety to fix it. And he did. And that's that page. And again, thank you, Thomas Henry and the containment unit for sending that to me because uh, I know I have the actual page somewhere, but I have no idea where it is. As I clean my garage, more things are showing itself. Like, for example, I have my welcome letter from Disney as an Imagineer. Can you believe it? I found it the other day. I also found my contract. For when I got into SAG, I found my contract for hire, being hired on Ghostbusters. I found the contract. Wow. Wow. I have call sheets. I have my script. You know, those kind of things you think a person would save, but all that stuff, whoa. I mean, I save everything. It's like, you know, I don't want to say I'm a pack rat, but I was just surprised at all of the things that I saved. And if you guys want to see those, I will pull them out. I was blown away when I saw how much I saved. In fact, I came across this the other day. And this is from, when is this from? I don't know if it's going to give me a date. Maybe on the inside. Let's see. It's a golden book. From the golden book, 1988. Okay, are you ready? Oh my gosh. Check this out. It's a Roger Rabbit coloring book, a big coloring book. And I have not colored in it, but here's where it says uh, trademarked and copyright 1988 right here. Let me turn this line on. You guys can see the 1988 is right there. Woo! Oh my goodness. I couldn't believe this. Look at how like the little pages are yellow, but it's in pretty doggone good condition. Isn't it cool? Look at him. Oh, I used to save these things. I save these because if I've got to do, in fact, I have a Jessica rabbit I'm doing on commission for my friend Nate. And uh, this is going to be helpful. However, in this book, the Jessica is not correct. So I have to be careful because the Jessica doesn't look right. Look at her. She doesn't look right at all. Here, I'm trying to see if I can give you a good light. She doesn't look like the real Jessica. I don't know what the artist was drinking who made this. but So I can't use that as an example, but... Uh, it will be inspiring to read the stories and just kind of re reimagine Roger Rabbit as I do that com commission of Jessica Rabbit. And if Nate says I can, once I finish the concept drawing, I'll show you what my plans are with her. And then he's given me permission to document my journey because I have to document my journey for him, but I need to share it with you. So that's kind of cool, right? Yeah. So, so to answer your question, Angie, we were left out of the credits because production felt like we should be. And then Richard Edlund said, that was not in my contract. And they said, au contraire, mon ami, mon ami. And they kind of snuck it in. And this will happen. So thank goodness for everything. Joshua Schaefer uh, says, it's releasing on Disney Plus and theaters at the same time. This is Raya and the Dragon. And uh, again, not paying my 30 bucks. No, I'm not going to do that. Also, Joshua Schaefer, this is the one that I want to bring in on uh, Monday to uh, we'll both talk to you about a new thing that we've got going and we want to share it with you because it's special. So I hope you'll tune in. I should have really said something at the beginning when people weren't, you know, on their way during their thing as we hit three hours and 13 minutes. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And a thumbs up from Deanna. Thank you. Way to fly in car. I missed that, Bonnie. Just Google it. It is cool. It is cool. It looks a lot like uh, there's a car that my husband loves called the Aptera that eventually didn't get made. I always thought it looked like a plane. 
But this one reminded me of the Aptera. So take a look. It's so cool. They actually do do a little test with it. One of the teachers I work helped design the first cover. Our daughter, Lendra, says Rose, took us to JPL. It's so cool to see everything there. JPL is amazing. JPL, I cannot remember exactly where they are, Rose Burdeen, but I do know that they are near La Cunada, and La Cunada always would win the animation uh, trophy for the Rose Parade, the Pasadena Tournament of Roses, because they helped the Rose people create the mechanisms to make the animated floats in the self-built category. So there's a little trivia for you. Deanna makes a smile. Oh my gosh, you guys are just so wonderfully chatty. Thank you. Um, during our visit to JPL, Rose would run over by the moon rover. How can you not? How can you not? When I was over at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, I had lunch with an astronaut. And let me be clear, it wasn't just me and this amazing astronaut. It was about 200 people and the amazing astronaut and the amazing astronaut was Story Musgrave. And Story and I still keep in touch today. Because afterwards we had a chat and found out, you know, Imagineer to Imagineer. And Story did the most shuttle missions. He was the shuttle captain for the most missions. It's been an honor and a pleasure to know him. And I just, I just love talking to story. He's a man of few words, but what, I, and he keeps telling me I ought to get on it and, and sign up for this thing with the civilian flight. He says, everybody gets motion sick, but I'm a little <laughs> shaky about it. Bonnie says I had to Google a flying car. Was it an aeromobile? I feel so behind the news this week. I didn't get to watch the Mars landing either. We'll look it up at lunch. Yeah, YouTube or the NASA channel. So if you don't have access to the NASA channel, uh, go to the NASA channel on YouTube and it's all there and you'll feel like it's right there live, Bonnie. Um, it's the one thing that I'm kind of ahead of other people on just simply because or with people <laughs> because I'm such a space squid. So that's the truth. It was fun and so cute. I know, I know, Rose, my goodness. The capsules that the astronauts usually flew in, the, the Geminis and all of that. Wow, when you look inside, you're like, how did they do it? Tin Cansville, but how fun. Hi, Bella and Grandma. Boy, this seems a little late. Is this late or am I full of baloney? No, 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 because we were talking about 11 o'clock being a around seven. So it is getting late for you, Bella, but not as bad as I thought. And Janice says, hello. Join Terry, Jana, Janice says, join Terry's Patreon page. Everyone, it's so good. Terry's been the best, very funny. She shows up special things. Try to do the best I can. I'm not perfect, okay? That is the first thing I'm gonna share with you and I never will be. I fall... I fail forward a lot. And what we all try to do on the page and here is to let you know failing's okay. All right. My channel isn't super pristine and super luxe. It's just that there's a big heart here, mine, boom, 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 for you. So, um, and, I, and that's what Bella said. She couldn't stay because she's probably done. But the nice thing about all of this, guys, is that you can come back. And if you've come back and I've already disappeared for the weekend, please comment and I will do my very best to answer you. My weekends are very busy, so it may be it may be till Monday or Tuesday when I actually do answer you, but I will. I'll do my best. Just, again, I fail forward very well. You guys made a family picture? Oh, that's so great. Family pictures are the best, aren't they? Are you going to lean me towards kinetic sculptor? Lean more towards kinetic. Yeah, well, did you like that, Ron? See, that kinetic sculptor, what they're talking about is that Oswald the Lucky Rabbit is the first sculpture that I have that actually spins. And he's holding his little feet and he's like, <laughs> he's kind of like Digger. But people that were Oswaldians who love Oswald the Lucky Rabbit uh, were the ones that told me it's called If One Rabbit's Foot is Good, Two is Better. That's the title of it. And it's him sitting on his butt and he spins is what Ron's talking about. And uh, he is adorable. The box is cute. Everything's cute about him. Um, I don't know. I mean, he looks like this pin, only he's a sculpture. Okay. 
I don't know if I have the actual sculpture in my repertoire. I should. I'm going to look now, but I don't know if I do. And if I don't, shame on me for not having him in here. But uh, he is super cute. He's super wonderful. Some have suggested uh, uh, Gogru, the Go Gogurt. I keep calling him Gogurt, Grogu. Um, that some people have suggested that. And unless I can come up with a way that he might be unique and different, uh, I won't be sculpting him soon, but he's not completely off the charts because I know you guys are so excited about him and, uh, and I'll see what I can do for you. Oh, here we go. Uh, I have, oh yeah, I have some, I have some Aussie Waldies. I don't know if I have any Aussie Waldies spinning, but here's some Aussie Waldies. You can see what he looks like as a sculpture. Um, here's the rough of him. And this was with many of you helped, many of the Oswaldians helped to make him the, who he is. I would sculpt and bounce it off you. What do you like? Isn't he sweet? Doesn't he have that cute little happy face? And again, this is a rough clay sculpture. This is my super rough clay sculpture like Ron is talking about. Oh, look, it's a frog. Where, how did that get on there? You see what I mean about kids? They just jump on when they when they think about it and uh, don't really <laughs> photobombed by a frog. Uh, here is the uh, Oswald, the lucky rabbit. He's sitting on a paper towel because we just kind of clear coated his cute little body. We wanted him to look like a little animated character. And then here is uh, the Oswald right here. He's on my cutting board. Uh, ignore the knife. There he is like right there. There he is. Isn't he cute? He's really cute. He's got the little blue shorts. Oh, look, it's the, see, there we go. It's always something different. Always something new and innovative. Uh, I thought I had a spinning video of Oswald, but I can't find the spinning Oswald video or I would show him to you. Seriously, uh, as um, Leo has said, I do have tons of stories. And they just, they just keep coming. So Ron, if you'd like a kinetic sculpture, who would it be? Who do you think would look good as a kinetic sculpture and what would they be doing? You know, if you suggest it and I do it, you get number one. Just ask Joshua Schaefer. If you do another, it should be the Cheshire Cat. Here we go. See, Leo. And only his smile should illuminate. <laughs> so Josie Katz asked for the Cheshire Cat. And, uh, I was gonna, I was thinking of doing the Cheshire cat this year, full, full disclosure. And now I'm trying to decide, uh, if I make it glow in the dark, the eyes and teeth glow, I can't do illuminate cause she doesn't want it to illuminate. And this is, this is her vision and my vision together. But I'm wondering if maybe it might be cool to make him a little black light or make his teeth and eyes glow in the dark you know, something like that as opposed to illuminating. I'm done with illumination for a while, to be honest with you, Leo. I just don't want to make another thing that involves batteries. It really shook me up, which is why, you know, if you can afford those ghosts, now is the time. No pressure. Just this artist is not going to want to do that for a while. It's always amazing. I'm always amazed on everything you've worked on, Terry, and in the cupboard, haven't watched it for so long, but I remember that scene. I remember being amazed as a kid watching. <laughs> it's true. Bonnie, it's true. I am sometimes amazed at, I, when I was looking in this drawer the other day and I said, oh my gosh, the popples, which were little toys that, that were little characters that turned into backpacks. I did a show. I did that show. Yeah, the coloring, but what is that? What? 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 You know, if you want to see some of my old concept art, I've got that too. I just, I opened this drawer and it was like a rainbow came out, you know, like Skittles. It just came out. It was unbelievable. Three hours, 22 minutes, guys. Are you guys getting tired? This, this is good. Mommy just said, oh, you're on Terry. So stay up till finished. <laughs> Bella, your mom takes such good care of you. And we are almost done, grandma and mom. Uh, this was a great show as usual. Thanks, Terrio. I'm just glad that you guys like it. I, I'm so touched that you stay. I'm so touched that you stay. Uh, I mean, family tree picture. It's the one-on-ones. Yes, 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 yes. 
The family picture. Well, I think that's adorable. Told me off for my grand for off for my off for your grandma. I know, right? So much. Guys, we are at three hours and 23 minutes. If you've joined us in the middle, or you've joined us just at the very end, or you have no idea why someone would talk <coughs> for three hours and 23 minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. Do I have any tea left? Oh, I do. I'll finish by telling you why. In this world where the pandemic is running rampant and vaccines are here and then not here and then here and then not here. A world where hit and runs are happening more and more, a world that's just crazy. As long as the pandemic is going on and we are stuck in our homes or having to distance and not getting the benefit of a good heartfelt hug, I'll be here every Friday or as many as I can to give you this fireside chat, a chance for you to come in from the cold and sit and hear these crazy and wild stories with visual assistance. That's why I go so long on Friday. And I want to thank you for those of you who stayed till the end, but I also want to thank you if you're joining me later. Please post in the comments, even if it's like, I can't even believe that you were this energetic to do this for so long. It The energy comes from you. It really does. There are people who think it is just crazy for me to be on a live for this long without saying, uh, this is what you do next. <laughs> and now here's how to sculpt. This is how you do next. I mean, if the, the if it was a class in the last three hours, people would be fine with it. But you'll find that people, what people think are, is not necessarily what drives this boat. Numbers, followers, things like that, analytics. I don't know this stuff. All I know is I want to bring you good content. And I want you to feel comfortable and safe and happy, even if it's just for three hours. Watch it as many times as you want. We'll talk and celebrate movies like crazy. If you had, if you got to see the Star Wars Outpost at Downtown Disney, I did not get tickets. But if you did, please post somewhere and show us what you got to see and talk to us about what was there to buy. Uh, I thought I might want one of those helmets, you know, the Rebel Alliance helmets, the fighter pilot helmet. But what would I really do with it? It's nice to kind of think about it and then move on for me. Uh, but but I've really enjoyed this. I want to thank you for joining me. I want to thank you so much for hanging tough. And uh, I'm amazed at you guys. I am so flattered that you would sit and listen to all my stories every Friday for over three hours and uh, be so sweet and kind with your comments. And, your, and you guys had a lot of comments today. I have to say, I'm just so touched by all the comments that you have and asking if we are tired. <laughs> Sharon says, I'm funny. Yeah, my husband says, the one thing that I do well, Sharon, is talk. <laughs> I will have a wonderful weekend because Sunday is my husband's birthday and I've got something super cool planned. So I'll be happy to share that with you. Uh, I don't know if I'll do it Monday or if I'll do it Friday, but we'll, uh, we, we have become a little family. And I love you to death and I miss you guys so much. The other day when I was talking to Thomas of the containment unit, we were uh, seven feet apart and then I was leaning in to sign autographs over 80. And um, I was so grateful to have a human being that I could talk to, even if it was, you know, how you doing, by the way? I I miss you guys. I'm really a face-to-face -face kind of person. This is the way I was raised, is face-to-face. -face. My art does better. I mean, I did well, and you guys trust me, but I, I love when you take it in your hands and you're just so happy and surprised, and I get to see that on your face. It means a lot to me. That's the payoff. It's the real payoff, which is why I keep doing it. Yeah, and eventually I'm going to do my own stuff. I'm actually working on a piece right now. I, I, I've done one, finished it. But now I want to do another because there's a lot of my own art that I want to do too. But I'm really blessed to do this for you. And I, I hope you enjoy it. 
and we'll get back into stuff that's more, you know, not so much. Oh, thank you, Ron. I would love that. I would love that kinetic idea because we love you. Thank you. I know you do. I can feel it. Happy birthday. It will. It will be really good. It's going to be a little challenge because he's high risk and, and he's he's only going to be 64. So we we can't get the vaccine yet like many of you that are 65 and older got to do. Uh, we're so grateful you're safe. We're so happy you're safe. And we look for the day when we can too, be too. So I love you guys. Have a good time. Get outside if you can. If it's snowing, don't. <laughs> Unless you want to build a snowman. You want to build a snowman. This is the time to sing that song if you guys are out there. And then share with me, okay? If you're in snow and you decide you're going to build a snowman, I'd love for you to share it with me um, on my channel, on my page, whatever, okay? I love you guys. Do things nice for each other because it'll make you feel so much better. Thank you so much for joining me. And I will see you very, very soon. But for now, enjoy that weekend. Bye.